fourth watch starts now. Everybody, you're listening to the Fourth Watch with Justin Fall on the Fourth Watch Radio Network. I hope everyone's having a blessed week. Tonight we return to the airwaves after a nearly two-month hiatus as we hit the ground running with a deep examination of the popular and questionable practices surrounding destiny cards. We'll be going into many untapped areas that most researchers and news sources are failing to examine. There is much talk these days about Christ alignment, destiny cards, and the ministries of Bethel Church. And tonight, we join the conversation. We've got a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and start the adventure. Submit it for the approval of the Fourth Watch Radio Network. I call this episode, Destiny Cards, Dangerous or Divine, with special guest co-host, BDK. Well, it's officially Thursday, and that means it's officially time for the fourth watch. It is such a blessing to be back with you all, and we've got a great show on tap tonight. If you're a new listener, we're very grateful to have you tuning in, and we want to let you know that there's a brand new show posted every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard. Be sure to head on over to fourthwatchradio.com. That's F O U R T H W A T C H R A D I O.com. Fourthwatchradio.com. There you'll find show archives, links to our free mobile apps for Apple and Android devices, links to all of our websites, as well as a donate page that will show multiple ways you can help support the Fourth Watch Ministries. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes if that's your preferred method of listening. The Android app is finally back up and running in the Google Play Store, and the link has been fixed on our website. Google has removed all of our download data and our ratings, so if you don't mind, head over to the Google Play Store, leave a good review, and even re-download the app if you don't mind, which will get us back up into the download charts and make our app easier for people to find in searches. Also, our P.O. box has changed, so you can head over to fourthwatchradio.com and get our new mailing address under the Support Our Ministry tab on the website. So if you send us letters, hate mail, or love gifts, be sure to head on over and update our mailing address in your books. Now, tonight we hit a hard topic which so many people have mixed feelings about. I know that many of you have feelings about some of the people and even practices that we're going to be examining tonight. But we ask that you listen with an open mind and an open heart. Maybe even pause this right now and pray that the Lord would open your eyes and give you discernment to the things we're going to be discussing. I ask that you would put aside any predispositions that you may have regarding the ministries, churches, people, and practices that are going to be discussed tonight. This is an extended episode, and we should probably go ahead and jump right in. So with that said, let's go ahead and welcome back on my good friend and network co-host, BDK. BDK! Whoa, you just took five years off my life. What's up, Justin? BDK! And three years off my hearing. (laughs) Wow! Wow! BDK, what's up, player? (laughs) Not much, homeboy. Not much. Dude, this is crazy, man. Like, we're actually doing it. We haven't haven't done this. I haven't even done a show at all. Like, this is, like, my first time. I feel like I'm getting back into the swing of things, and, um... I, you know, I may have lost it. You know, I, hopefully I'm going to get back what I lost. I feel like the locusts have come and eaten like all of my podcasting skills. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I, you know. It's like riding a bike. Hopefully, hopefully I'm going to start pedaling here and it's going to come back to me. Um, but dude, what's up, bro? How are you? How have you been, man? Oh, I've been hanging in there, man. Like things have been kind of crazy. Things have been kind of rough. Things have been kind of broken, but you know, there's a certain aspect that God's near the broken, right? Yes. So I've been feeling really close to God lately. And um, I'll tell everyone out there that's listening the same thing. I always say, the blood of Jesus has never failed me yet. The blood of Jesus never fails me. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's right. 
you know, the enemy is always going to try to get our focus off of what's the most important thing in our lives. And as, as followers of Christ, as Christians, the most important thing that we could ever, ever, ever do is live a life of faith. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, the only way to please God is our faith. Like you, you can't please God with the law. You can't please God with the Torah. Okay. You know, I'm sorry. Some of you are going to get upset with me going there again, but I'm going to go there. You cannot please God outside of faith. And living faith is faith in Jesus Christ that does produce works, but you cannot ever please God without faith. And so the enemy is always going to try to attack our faith. Always. Like that is the target, is just to chip away at our faith. And I know both of us have been going through a lot. I'm not even going to break down what I've been going through. I know people uh, who've been following the frequency, they know what you've been going through. Um, you know what I've been going through. I've been under some physical attack, like actual physical, um, just chipping away. The enemy's been trying to hit me in my health. Um, but praise God, we're here tonight, and that's what matters. Our faith is going to remain because we've been bought with the precious blood of the Lamb. Amen. Jesus Christ. And that is why we are here tonight, to proclaim his goodness, his love. And tonight we're going to be proclaiming, out of his love, we're going to be proclaiming correction on some very, very, very damning things. And I'm not using that word as a cuss word. I'm actually saying the things we're talking about are damned. Like we are literally dealing with issues that are completely condemned by the word of God. I think it's probably appropriate to go ahead and just kind of break down something major that happened um, for many of you. And look, some of you guys are new to the fourth watch. You, you've been tuning in. You just found us on Facebook or you found us on YouTube. Um, yeah, you may not like this, th this intro, but we're going to go ahead and do this because you know what? We're not going to give you a prefab show every week. BDK just got done doing a raw gorilla style show. Um, we need to get some things out there and, and yeah, you could write this off as information that's needed for our regular listeners, for the fourth watch family, because we know there's a bunch of you out there and you know where we're coming from and you need updates on these things. But many of you know that I was part of a church back in, in Atlanta called New Bridge, and it was connected to a ministry of transforming truth, Jeff Lyle. He was my pastor, been one of my dear friends for over 10 years. Uh, I got very involved in the church over there. Uh, I've you know played some of his sermons on the fourth watch, promoted him on the fourth watch. He's promoted me uh, from the pulpit and from his, his ministry platform. And I just need to go ahead and just put this out there. And it's, it's great that BDK is here with me because BDK has followed the ministry of transforming truth and Newbridge church in Lawrenceville. Um, we no longer support Newbridge church. Okay. This is not an attack. I have to say this. I'm not here to call people names. I'm not going to make fun of them. I still love these people. I love them dearly, but there are major theological problems that have risen up over there, and the church is now moving into the new apostolic reformation. That's right. The church that I was heavily involved with, they are literally holding hands and merging with IHOP. And I'm not going to get into all the details and the specifics, but I need to publicly make the statement that the Fourth Watch Radio Network has absolutely zero connections or affiliations with the church New Bridge or with Transforming Truth of Lawrenceville, Georgia. I still love them. I still pray for them. I care about them, but they are going in a very dangerous place from everything that I can tell. And it's been a progression. It, it, it has progressed and it's gotten worse. And now they are officially merging with IHOP Atlanta. And you cannot separate IHOP Atlanta from IHOP Kansas City. You can't separate any IHOP from any IHOP. Yeah, they all pretty much are under the same mission. And they use a lot of the same music and a lot of the same Lexio Divina and um, support each other's conferences and things like that. It's a it's a sad thing because, like you said, I followed the ministry um, when you when you played that sermon. And I'm like, who is this guy? Who is this preacher? He's awesome. And then I started watching all their live simulcasts, which you were taping, by the way. That's how involved you were in all this. And um it's really sad, but that's what we're dealing with tonight, Justin. This is exactly what we're dealing with. We have people that know the truth. This guy once stood against this stuff. This guy once 
would never let some of these NAR type books in his church. This guy, you know, was against all of that stuff and it still found its way in. This is the fastest growing religious movement in the world. And that's how these churches operate. You won't see a sign outside of a church that says New Apostolic Reformation. They don't plant New Apostolic Reformation churches for the most part. What they want to do is they want to go and they want to take over existing ministries and infiltrate them because they then they have a built-in audience, they have a built-in structure, and obviously the devil, the more people that he can get, the more truth that can be confused, he's about that. And that's why this subject that we're going to be talking about tonight is so important because deception is creeping into the church. There's a lot of people in the Christian church that are so hungry for God's supernatural presence. They're so hungry for, for the supernatural aspect of scripture. And, and we believe in that, you know, we believe in the supernatural power of God. We, we, we've said it before. We believe in the, in the gifts of the spirit. Now, I, obviously I don't believe uh, that there is an ongoing office of apostle and prophet um, as the NAR pushes. That's a whole other discussion. But, you know, we don't I, I don't agree with that. But we're dealing with people who are so hungry. They go to these congregations and they're being completely just bewitched. Like that, that that's the word that really describes it. They're being bewitched. And, and that word shows up in the King James Bible where people are being deceived by spiritual means. It's almost like they're being spiritually brainwashed. They're being bedazzled, you know, they're, they're literally being bamboozled without having any recollection of the true source of the deception because they're experiencing it and they're experiencing it. And you can't ever tell somebody that their experience was wrong. You'll never be able to discredit someone's experience because it's their experience, even if it's demonic. If they believe it's a good experience, even if it's demonic, they are going to be completely convinced that it was of God, no matter what you tell them no matter what you show them in scripture. So anyway, I just want to throw that out there. I, I'm again, this is so personal for me because like, I love new bridge church. I love the people there. Um, and, and look, I'm not here to bad mouth pastor Jeff. I went to him privately and I spoke with him and he, you know, he basically told me that it was probably a good thing that the Lord was moving West and myself up to Missouri because he said that they were going to be merging with IHOP. And literally when he said that, like, it, it, I mean, I was speechless he didn't exactly say those words, but it was pretty much that was the gist of it. So anyway, I'm praying for them, but this is what happens. I've talked to Jeff, and you know what he said, BDK? He said, what's the NAR? <laughs> this, this is a pastor who's merging with IHOP Atlanta. Uh, he's merging with the Bickle machine, yet he doesn't even know what the NAR stands for. He doesn't even know what dominionism is. Yet he's merging with the church that is the poster boy of NAR, the poster boy of dominionism. Yet he's never heard these terms before until I came along and told him. This is how it creeps into the church. It creeps in just like so. And then before you know it, it's a slippery slope. It's kind of like the Hebrew roots movement. Everybody's all gung ho. Oh, I want to learn the Hebrew roots of the Bible. I want to learn the Hebrew roots of the Bible. You know, and then before you know it, they're like, they think they have to celebrate the feasts. They think they have to keep the Torah, which, which the New Testament tells you you can't keep the Torah. But regardless, this is, this is how it works. It starts off real easily. And now, you know, it's, it's like every other day that Hebrew roots people are coming out and they're like, Jesus isn't Christ. Jesus isn't God. Jesus isn't God. And if you believe he's God, you're a heretic. Paul's a heretic. You know, uh, the serpent seed. And, and look, I'm, I'm, the serpent seed, that's not even, that's not even an issue that I'm going to hit because, you know, there's good people that believe in that, even though it's a total lie. It's, it's, it's wrong. But the Hebrew Roots movement, it, you know, as good, it, as good as the intentions may be of you who were part of the Hebrew Roots movement. Okay, it starts off very simple, like learning the name Yeshua, you know, and I'm really pulling myself away from even using the name Yeshua. And I've told you this, BDK. Because it creates confusion amongst people. And the last thing I want to do is create confusion. But it starts off where you start saying Yeshua, right? Like, it's cool, I can use both names. And then it's it's Yahushua. Then it's Ashahawahi. And then it's like, you, you can't say it right. You can't please anyone. But there's only one right way to say it. And so if you don't say it right, you're going to hell. And, you know, the person who says this has already gone through, like, all 15 versions of the name in their lifetime. And they now have 
the ultimate way to say it. The sacred name cult, you know, Hebrew roots has turned into a major cult. It truly has. But people start off with good intentions. They truly want the best they can have with the Lord. And then Satan just exploits it. And that's what's going on here with the NAR. That's what's going on with the Hebrew roots. And, And I liken them together. Because they both start off very innocent, you know, it's like somebody somebody goes to an event and they feel this crazy spiritual presence, and or, or they see something, they see somebody get healed or something, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, I want more of that, you know, or wow, I just learned a Hebrew word, I want more of that, you know, I mean, look, I'm just, I'm breaking it down, and BDK, if, if I'm off my rocker here, if I'm getting a little too animated, correct me, but you and I have talked about this before, and I've likened the Hebrew Roots Movement to the NAR because like, honestly, like it starts off simple. And then before you know it, it's like, we're going to kill off everybody um, with these mercy killings because you know, these people are getting in our way. Uh, okay. You know what? I'm not saying Hebrew root people are going to kill off people, but that's the mercy killings. It's the same mindset. You know, they, they spiritually want to cut you off and say, you're not, you know, you're not even of God. You're not of Yahuwah. You're not of Yahuwah because you don't keep the feasts or you break Torah or you eat pork. I mean, look, I've heard it all. You don't wear your tzitzits, you know, and and some of these NAR people say, well, you're not saved because you don't speak in tongues. You don't heal people. Gold dust isn't falling down in your church. Angel feathers aren't coming down in your pastor's home. Okay, BDK, let me just please take it. I'm, I'm I'm ranting over here and this is what happens. No, you make good points because we're going to be talking about something very specific tonight. But before we do, let's broach it from a larger point. And let me jump off your point. A lot of people will ask, well, you know, like, how can a church like Newbridge be deceived? These are people that are strong in doctrine at one point. How do they get roped in? How can they join a church without even knowing what the word NAR means or, you know, New Apostolic Reformation? Um How are these churches getting deceived? How come all this new age stuff that's so blatant is happening? And this is nothing new, man. This has been going on for 70 years or so. Um, Alice Bailey, occultist Alice Bailey, had a plan to um, infiltrate churches. And I want to read a quote. She says, the Christian church in its many branches can serve as a St. John the Baptist or a forerunner, a voice crying in the wilderness, a nucleus through which the world illumination may be accomplished. The church must show a wide tolerance. The church as a teaching factor should take the great basic doctrines and show their true and inner spiritual significance by shattering the old forms in which they are expressed and held. The prime work of the church is to teach and teach ceasingly, preserving the outer appearance in order to reach the many who are accustomed to church uses. Teachers must be trained, Bible knowledge must be spread, and the sacraments must be mystically interpreted, and the power of the church to heal must be demonstrated. Now, what she's talking about is infiltrating the church using the outer trappings and the terminologies of the church to bring in new age doctrines. And she wrote scores of books to serve as manuals on how to infiltrate churches. And people have been putting this into practice for 70 years or so. Now a student of Alice Bailey is Matthew Fox. He's a famous new age teacher. And he wrote in his book, the coming of the cosmic Christ this, and this will be very germane to our conversation tonight. He says, without mysticism, there will be no deep ecumenicism, which is why the church must show the wide tolerance. No unleashing of the power of wisdom from all of the world's religious traditions. The promise of ecumenicism, the coming together of religions, has been thwarted because world religions have not been aligning At the level of mysticism, the Western tradition appears to have nothing to offer on a mystical level because its religious traditions are unaware of their mystical heritage. Now, here's the thing. If we align ourselves with others spiritually, 
or if we're going to join another church or if we're going to merge churches or we're going to hold hands with someone else. It used to be it used to be on the basis of scripture and doctrine. We would used to say, well, we will have fellowship with you because you agree on these essentials or you agree on the core tenets of the faith or you agree on the classic time tested doctrines of the Bible. But this new, quote unquote, alignment is based off of experience and mysticism. Why? Because it can be a shared experience that transcends the written boundaries of Scripture. So no longer do we have to agree on the doctrines of Christ. We mystically reinterpret, reinterpretate all the sacraments or all the, the um, meats and bones of, of the church. We, we make everything mystical, right? And that's how we align. Now it's, oh, you got slain in the spirit? I got slain in the spirit. Well, you can't be wrong. You speak in tongues and I speak in tongues. Oh, you were speaking in tongues while praying the rosary? Well, that must, oh, how can I question that? It's the Holy Ghost, right? So we are moving away from the Bible and we're moving into shared mystical experiences. And that's why we see this rise in the occult through Christianity. That's why we see the new age things like angel boards and destiny cards and all of these things flooding the church because it's a way for everyone in all major world religions to have that shared experience. And like I said, it's nothing new. This has been Alice Bailey's plan from like 70 years or so ago. So that's how this kind of stuff happens, Justin. Yeah. And, and she's no joke. I mean, she was the real deal. I, I mean, for occultists, um, you know, I, I bought one of her books just to have it in the library. Uh, I wanted to have an actual rep- This was back before, like, you know, now you can get PDFs and screenshots and stuff. So like back in the day, I, I wanted to get a hard copy, but I bought one of her books and it was like like forty dollars for a paperback, like that's how real this stuff is. Like people will pay forty plus dollars for a paperback of these types of books. Like they're very much real. They they outline uh, the structure, the occult structure that they have literally been building for this this dawning of the age of Aquarius, this new Atlantis called America. You know this occult revival, the the revival of the mystery schools of Babylon. And it's, it's literally, the church is so hungry for something of, of experience, something of spiritual experience, that they're willing to not test every spirit the way we're, we're commanded to in the New Testament. We're told to, to test every spirit. Because if you don't, you can be deceived. Even Christians, good-intentioned Christians, are going to be deceived. They are being deceived. And if we don't step up and start litmus testing this stuff you know i love the writings of john because it's like john like he, he he almost like he shows you how to litmus test yourself to see if you're really saved like you know it's like here test yourself test yourself and and it's like the, these christians today or or whatever you want to call them I, and again this is not an attack on on people that i know from back in atlanta this is not like that at all this is simply we're, we're and I, I really want to make that clear because i do love these people but when you go and you try to hold someone accountable and you, and you present this information, and, and look, BDK, you and I have done over 12 and a half hours together. To just, just, I mean, just me and you, we've done over 12 and a half hours of teaching on the NAR, on the IHOP deception, on the Bethel deception, on the, this whole like cesspool of demonic activity that's being packaged as Christianity. Like we've done over 12 and a half hours in 2016. I'm sorry, was it 2016 or 20? But uh, maybe it was, I think 2016. Yeah, Yeah, 2016. Okay, 2016. And I know we did a bunch in 2017 as well. So, I mean, we have over 12 and a half hours between 2016 and 2017 of just teachings on the NAR, trying to warn people and sound the alarm so that people can say, hey, you know what? This is really happening. And, and you know, it's, it's important to know the who, what, where, when, and why. I think that's really important. And, and, you know, it's like crime scene investigation. You know, it's church scene investigation. We want to know what's going on in the church. But what's just as important is the names because it's not always, it's not always, you know, important that you drop names. You know, sometimes it's about like the doctrine. And this is a great example because the doctrine has been creeping into my old church, it has nothing to do with the names. 
It's the doctrine. I tried to explain the doctrine. They didn't even know the names of this stuff. They didn't know dominionism. They didn't know what the NAR was, but the doctrine was there. The theology was there. So it's very important that we understand that this stuff is creeping in. It's part of the New World Order's plan to hijack the religious systems, the religious, um, not just Christianity, you know, but to literally hijack any parts of religious systems that are, we'll just say, self-sufficient. Like Christianity says we're the only way, right? Other there's there, There's a couple other religions that do make bold claims such as that, that they're the only right one. And so this New World Order system of religion wants to chip away at all of those establishments to where it's all this big unified cesspool. That That's the goal. That's the goal. And it's been the goal for a long time. And it really goes back to the Tower of Babel and what was taking place before God brought judgment on that area. But regardless, it's going to get worse and we need to know what's going on. And, you know, I, I don't listen to this band anymore, but I used to listen to Rage Against the Machine all the time when I was younger. I didn't even understand what their lyrics were about. You know, like I was just a little punk kid <laughs> with my Walkman on. Remember the Walkman, the tape player, Sony Walkman with my double A batteries. I was riding around my bicycle, my 10 speed smoking with cigarettes, listening to Rage Against the Machine and, and uh, you know, but they had this song that was before I got saved, by the way. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and you were smoking with cigarettes. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I said I, I used to not say it like that, but um, I, I watched this show, but I'm going to say what it's called because someone's going to criticize me for watching this this show. But they this kid got caught smoking, and they're like, he's smoking with cigarettes. Like, so. <laughs> but um, yeah, so anyway, my, my point of the matter is um, Rage Against the Machine. They had this song, and it's it's called Know Your Enemy. And literally, I mean, like, that is a line that could practically be from the book of hesitations in the Bible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, like, you have to know your enemy. And, you know, so many Christians are like, why do you do this? Why do you get so involved in this? Why, you know, why are you always exposing this or exposing that? I'm like, look, dude, we are told to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness, but to rather expose them or in the King James to rather reprove them which means the same thing, correct, expose, rebuke. And part of that is explaining to people why they're dangerous. And it's 2018. It is 2018. We have a new year. And look, I don't, please, Hebrew rooters, do not come at me about the new year, okay? Oh, well, it's not the Hebrew new year. Okay, I get it. Okay, and we're not in Yerushalayim either, okay? Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. Like, the, the, the thing that really kills me is when somebody writes me an email and, like, every other word is English and every other word is, like, you know what Spanglish is? Well, they've got, like, Spanglish <laughs> Hebrew. They've been reading their IRS scriptures Bible, and it's, like, every other word is, like, Yerushalayim, the Yehudim. I mean, come on, people. Just, you speak English, right meaning. Okay, you know what? I've already, like, made this R-rated, and I did not want to. Moving on. This is this is talk radio. You know, if, if you're a new listener, you probably have already turned this off by now. <laughs> but um, all right, back on track here. Back on track. It's been a while. I just feel like there's so much we need to talk about. But uh, bottom line is this: we have to know what's coming. We have to know where we are as a church and the things that are creeping in. And most of you have already heard about this Christ alignment. And it's just ironic that the Christ alignment is being welcomed by the New Apostolic Reformation. And and here, my my last church that I was very involved in, you know, they are seeping into the New Apostolic Reformation. And these things are creeping into different churches. And so many Christians are jumping to the defense, not only of Bethel Church, but they're jumping to the defense of Christ alignment. Um, just, just, why don't we go ahead? I, I have... Um, I went ahead back when all this was kind of first getting started. Uh, I had gone to the Christ Alignment website and I had literally downloaded their entire website because I didn't want to take any chances of them changing things. You know, they kind of have a reputation for changing things on people. And we're going to get into that, how they took down the video of the topless dancers at their drum circle. Um, you know, we're going to get into that here in a minute. But Christ Alignment, this is the new thing. And it's basically introducing witchcraft, which Bethel already allows witchcraft to go on in their church. They already have these things happening at their church. But now they're they're holding hands with this ministry called Christ Alignment. And if you want to check them out, it's ChristAlignment.org. Christ, 
alignment.org. But I wanted to go ahead and download their website before it got changed or edited or altered or anything because I knew that this was fishy and I wanted to get my hands on it. And as soon as you get there, uh, they basically have these these cards and, and they don't look exactly like tarot cards. Like they, they look a little different. I'll, I'll give a little credit there. They're, they're these artistic renditions, um, but they're meant to look like tarot cards. Like they're meant to be used um, at these new age festivals. And they sell this whole thing as being something that is good. Like it's, it's a way for them to become all things to all men. And I know BDK, you're going to, you're going to talk about that here in a sec, but you go through this page and they, they let you know on their website that their cards lead the way. Like that's actually the headline here. It says our cards lead the way. And if they change their website sometime in the next few days or weeks and you want a copy of this, I've got this. I, I literally downloaded it all as a PDF. I'll be more than happy uh, to, to make it available to anybody that wants it. But th- this is what it says. Our cards lead the way. And there's pictures of their their people, you know, their, their gurus, if you will, sitting at tables at new age events. And they've got the cards laid out and they're reading. They're doing what they call destiny readings. And this is the quote. It says, you can't come into your destiny until you take responsibility for your own life. Okay. So they're they're basically... They use quotes to kind of safeguard themselves. They want to try to safeguard themselves and, and, and what this all really is. But then we can we can read into what they're saying here. It says it's a Christ alignment team uses at least five different types of cards and destiny readings. These are not necessary for an intuitive reader, as we are all hearing from the third heaven realm. <laughs> okay, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> Like this is like somebody is smoking crack cocaine or smoking crystal meth. Like this is how cracked out this is. They're actually promoting the idea that they use these cards, right? And in using their cards, they're actually all, all of their staff is hearing from the third heaven realm. (laughs) BDK, do you you even want to comment on this? Like, well, it's crazy because they're like, well, we don't necessarily need to use these cards. We just do because all our people are trained to hear from the third heaven, the voice of God. Well, if that's the case, then why use them? Why use cards like this? Well, I'll tell you why. Because you go to these new age festivals and these new age occult uh parties that they're at and basically it's just a bunch of booze with people hawking their new age goods and their crystals and all this other riffraff and drama if you were to stand outside with a bible and say i'm gonna preach i'm gonna open air preach i'm gonna preach the word of god or i'm gonna set up a booth and and hope people come so that i can preach the word of god to them or tell them what the bible says about the new age like nobody's gonna come no one They're just going to be like, shine that, that's Christian. So they feel that they can be all slick and go in undercover and use things that new agers are going to be very comfortable with, like destiny cards. They look like tarot cards. So they'll sit down and like, what are you doing at this booth? Well, we're giving out readings with these cards. And they're like, cool, sign me up. Like some of the people even are naked while they're giving the readings to them, right? Like they'll show up, they'll be completely naked from doing whatever they're doing out in their their festival, getting high, dropping, you know, the LSD or whatever they're doing or they're, they're channeling or whatnot. And they come over to the Christ alignment booth and the people that they're reading to, you know, completely naked, sitting down. What are you doing here? What What's your booth all about? Oh, well, we're Christ alignment and we'd love to give you a reading with these cards or maybe paint you with some henna art. And they're like, groovy, dude, we love that. And so now they're hearing from the third heaven, Justin, right? The Holy ghost is, they have a main line to heaven and there's some naked chick sitting across from you and you're a dude. What's the first thing the Holy ghost is going to say? Let's just back up for a sec in all reality. Okay. So I, I may have like not explained perfectly before I brought you in on that. They have five different types of destiny cards uh, that they that they use, or five different types of cards that they use in these readings. But they're saying that these cards are not necessary for intuitive readers, okay? Because everyone on their team is hearing from the third heavens. But the use of cards greatly enhances the reading. Okay, so what we're dealing with are people who are being communicated with by entities who are in the third heavens. That's That's what they're saying here on their website. 
They're getting their messages directly from the third heaven realm, okay? But they don't have to use the cards. Like they have intuitive uh, intuitive readers that are more intuitive than others. And they can read people and they can operate and give people readings without even touching the cards, but the cards greatly enhance the reading. And they also go on to say that they believe that they are more predictive and higher than most cards and can address a current life question that you may have. Card readings with Christ alignment are always followed by the reader taking the client into an encounter in the highest realm. Oftentimes, color is seen. Okay, are, are, we, are we just like right in the middle of a new age festival here? Because, you know, why don't they just come out and call it an aura? An aura? You know, uh, they're saying color is often seen, and it is in this realm that answers come from for poignant questions that clients have and lives are changed. So we're not just dealing with cards that look like tarot cards. We're dealing with entities communicating from the third heaven realm. This is right off their website. And there's colors involved and they can read the colors as well. Like, and this is all on their official website. This is not like some speculation here. This isn't like Justin and BDK just having a, a holiday here talking about these things. No, this is I downloaded all this from their website. It's just really crazy stuff. And again, they mention the heaven realm, the third heaven realm. Again, they say that we call our artists. Yeah, get this, right? Because their cards have to be created by artists. And Bethel, Bethel Church, again, we're, you know, let's go back to Bethel for a second. Bethel is really keen on promoting the arts and culture and arts and culture. And, and look, that's cool. I get it. Okay. There's nothing wrong with the arts. Fact is, God is like the most amazing artist that will ever be. He's the creator. And what is art? Art is where you come and you create something. So I can get on board with art. I love art. Matter of fact, we have a lot of listeners that are some amazing artists. I've seen your work on, on Facebook and on YouTube and stuff. Even if I don't talk to you, like if you're an artist and you put your stuff on Facebook, like I've probably seen it and it's amazing. Like there's more than a few of you that, that are coming to mind right now. We love art. Like art can be an amazing, awesome gift from the Lord, right? I, you know, I, I'm all about art. But these destiny cards, they got to go, okay? And they're calling their destiny card artists prophetic. So they're actually calling this prophetic art. And this means that as intuitive readers themselves and artists are able to connect with spirit, their artwork carries meaning and power to change lives. So they're, they're now redefining this type of prophecy. They're creating their own type of prophecy here. And they're explaining what it means. It says each painting has been done through connection to the third heaven realm. So these paintings are coming from the third heaven realm, BDK. I mean, hey, forget your Van Gogh. You know, forget your dolly. Let's go for the destiny cards, bro. These things are going to be worth so much more during the tribulation because these came straight from the third heaven realm. You know, forget Marguerite. Forget your Mona Lisa, pal. We've got destiny cards coming straight at you from the third heaven realm. Now, to me, that sounds extremely new age and totally messed up. And they give all the names, but here, here's the deal. We, we have to move on. I, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm going to get ticked off. You know, why do I get ticked? Is it okay for me to get ticked, BDK? Do I have a good reason to be upset about this? Um, we'll discuss it later on. Paul gets pretty upset by all of it. Okay, so uh, they, they, they already, they, they've told us that they've got different cards, right? We've got different kinds of cards here. They've got color cards. Color cards can be used in several different ways. Team member Nan, okay, so whoever Nan is, team member named Nan uses the color cards to enhance her reading with colored agate stones. So she's using colored stones and colored cards in her readings. And then she explains that colors have had an important role to play spiritually in history, and they have significant meanings in the dream state as they are imbued with meaning and power. These readings can really change lives and give comfort and hope. Look, I'm all about giving comfort and hope to people, but I don't need to play these new age games to do it. I can just tell people about the love of Christ, what he did on Calvary, that they need to come to Christ and repent. You know, I can pray for people that God would draw them to him in repentance, but I don't need to play these new age games. So, you know, again, they use, they use these hot button words, these X factor words. If you're in sales, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but then they have animal card readings. This is great. Anybody ever heard of a spirit animal? I know, I know we joke about spirit animals sometimes, me and my friends. Um, 
because it's totally retarded. Like we would never actually have a spirit animal, but they have animal card readings. And it says many people sympathize with animals. And in a reading using these cards, three will be visualized in the encounter. (laughs) Oh my goodness. The meaning of the animal will have great significance to the client and could give deep insight to life issues and feelings. So we've got color cards. We've got animal cards. Here's a here's an interesting one. We've got psalm cards. Psalm readings. Oh, that sounds kind of like palm readings, doesn't it? <laughs> psalm reading. What kind of a clever freak came up with this name? Psalm card readings. We're going to read your psalms. Psalms for the poor. Psalms for the poor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> psalm readings are similar to other card readings where cards are counted out according to your birth date date and year only three cards are used and these will be possibly these will possibly represent your past present and future and then we've got destiny cards destiny readings they explain that they've they've created these these cards they're unique destiny cards they've been developed and they're so accurate that even if your life circumstances change dramatically if you return later down the road to have your cards reread you're going to find out that the result of your destiny cards is going to be identical. That's how accurate they are. These cards are going to give profound insight into relationships, career, and spiritual life. This is right off of their website. Now, you're probably wondering, like, who the freaking heck are these people? Who's Christ alignment? And like everything that I just got done, uh, all these things I'm looking at on their website. This is not, again, I'm not making this up. I'm not embellishing this. I'm reading this from their website. And so this is exactly who Bethel Church, Redding, California, who is absolutely no stranger to controversy. Bethel Church is promoting this ministry publicly. They're sharing their, I mean, Christ Alignment is now a household name at Bethel. And they've called people like us fake news. Now, look, I don't agree with everything that Pirate Christian puts out. I don't agree with every stance that Pulpit and Pen takes. Okay? Some of these so-called discernment ministries go a little too far sometimes. It's almost like the guy on Facebook that's like, everybody's doing an Illuminati hand sign. Like, I'm scratching my ear you know, and like, oh, Justin's doing an occult hand sign. Oh, 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 you see, you see. And I mean, look, not everything is intentional. There are some times where these discernment ministries go too far. But I want to say this, Pirate Christian and uh, Pulpit and Pen, whether you like them or not, they have covered real news about this whole, you know, situation. And Chris Valaton of Bethel, you know, unfortunately, he's been quoted by my old pastor. Yeah, th- th- this is just, again, it, it all connects, guys. All the dots connect behind the scenes. You know, my old pastor is is reading their books and quoting them and recommending their ministries. I mean, that's just how it's going to work, right? Slippery slope. Slippery dickery dot. Point of it is, Chris Valaton publicly comes out and calls people like us fake news because we're covering this. But, you know, what I've noticed is most people aren't covering the details. They're just kind of mowing over the details. So we're, we want to cover the details tonight. Um, we're going to get back to Psalm card readings because there are connections here. But BDK, I know you want to comment on the Destiny cards. And um, are, are you looking at the PDF that I made? Do you have that in front of you by chance? Yeah, I am, man. Okay, so you see the, the first book that we're going to hit here in a second after the Destiny cards? Yeah, signs and wonder tarot cards for Christians. Okay, like we don't have to go right into that, but but please. Remember how I said this is all going to connect, like the, the, the New Apostolic Reformation is going to connect with the Hebrew Roots Movement? We're going to get into that here in a second. I wasn't just making that up. Unfortunately, some of you have probably already turned this off who are following the Hebrew Roots Movement, and you're upset that I did not celebrate the Fall Feast with you and your family. But we're going <laughs> we're, we're to get through this. <laughs> go ahead, VDK. Yeah, the other thing that you didn't mention too, man— is that that's only half of what they do at these uh, festivals. They have another thing called henna art. And I want to just hit this very briefly. Um, in the New Age movement, henna art is really, really popular. It's kind of like a red ink. It's not like tattoo, but it's like an ink design that stains the skin and will stay for like a month or so. And it's a very deeply spiritual way of tattooing yourself 
that releases mystical energy. And so, of course, Christ alignment is all about the henna art. Um, this is also from their website, quote, Christ alignment henna art at all festivals, expos and the market. Our artists take pride in their henna work. We have finally arrived at a beautiful recipe for our own organic henna, which is dark, staining, and long-lasting. Clients choosing sample designs from our books, or they can bring along their own, soon realize that our henna art is not only decorative, but carries a special blessing from the artist. And then they show all kinds of pictures, of, and none of them are, are Christian symbols they're all lizards and flowers and birds and antlers and deers and what was that thing that you what was that thing you talked about um do you remember the show we did uh funny that we should go here again but nar based show we did uh, about the adult coloring books yeah it's very much like that i mean if you look at it it, the henna art looks almost exactly like it but henna art is even more devious than the than the mystical new age um sort of implications of the coloring books right because henna art is a very old tradition and the origin of henna art and i'm taking this straight from hennapage.com and you can look at this up on wikipedia it's almost exactly the same it says that this is a fertility bride tradition and it's kind of ironic because if you know anything about the New Apostolic Reformation, one of their hallmarks is, we're the warrior bride of Christ. We get up and we kiss Jesus, and Jesus kisses us, and we do all kinds of crazy stuff with Jesus, and we're going to be the warrior bride that unleashes all the plagues in the book of Revelation. And yet these guys at Christ Alignment are inking themselves as warrior brides, not to Christ, but this has its... um historical origin in Baal worship justice, Justin. Baal worship. Well, it is time for justice, and you can call me justice because just, <laughs> hey, just in time for justice, right? Right. I've got friends who love the Lord, and they have been called to go to India to minister the gospel. And I don't mean in terms of the Holy Ghost movie by Darren, uh, what's the name, okay? Um, because I, I still don't know what exactly they did in India that was gospel-related. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, you know, they ran around and sang some songs and, and, and whatever. Um, yeah, I, I did watch the Holy Ghost movie because I needed to find out more about what the Bill Johnson shenanigans were up to because they're all connected. I've done a lot of research here. Part of that is watching movies that were made by the NAR. But I got friends, let's say they go to India, and they, they actually want to proclaim the gospel of Christ and they want to tell people that they're in idolatry and that they've got to turn away from all these gods in their pantheon and that they've got to come to the true Christ. And it's okay if, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're a Hindu, it's totally cool to become a Christian because you can worship anything you want to worship. So it's actually really easy to witness to a Hindu, depending on how dogmatic they are, because they're very open to other gods. And they're allowed to worship other gods. I've known Hindu people that actually had an idol to Jesus. I know that sounds crazy. It's a whole other story for another time. But they go, they go to India. They're sitting down, probably eating food that was sacrificed to idols. Because that's how you get in with some of these people. You eat whatever they serve you. You're, you know, you're being taken into their home, into their temple. Um, what would you say to somebody? Or, I mean, because because these people have a different mindset. They're not trying to be really cool and and trippy at these festivals in America. They're actually going to become all things to all people in India. That's a little bit different, I think, than over here. And, and maybe I'm wrong, BDK. Maybe, maybe I'm no, showing. You, you have an interesting point, and interestingly enough, this is one of the questions that we get asked for um, ready with an answer. Uh, that's coming up on next Monday. So I'm going to save the majority of my answer for that. But you'll have to tune in to hear it. See how I hyped the other show? Trickies of me. Phil but Baker. No, like, <laughs> Phil Baker. <laughs> but um, no, like, let me answer your question six, try as six, succinctly as possible. Uh, but oh, man, you, you, see, a, you see the importance of this. Like, it, it's yeah, a yeah. very valid here's question. The, here's the thing, right? Like, Paul's very clear about this. Like, what goes into us doesn't defile us. You know? It's like... If I were to eat something and I'm being respectful, right, like I'm a missionary, 
missionary custom has always been if you go into somebody's house and they offer you something to eat, it would be rude not to eat it because it's not going to defile you. You know, it's going to go in and it's going to poop you out. What's going to poop out basically is what the passage says. Okay. Um, but what defiles a man is something that comes from the heart. Well, what's the heart? It's the head. It's the knowledge. Okay. If you have knowledge of something and it's a cult origins and you partake in it, then you are doing the gospel a disservice because you are there to proclaim the gospel of Christ. And the gospel of Christ is not a mixture of the occult and Christianity. There's only one God, Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto God but by him. And I've heard missionaries use this as a, as a starting off point. I don't mean to offend you, but I can't eat this. Or I don't mean to offend you, but I can't put that henna art on me. Or I don't mean to offend you, but I can't uh, say grace with you while you have the statue of Baal. And then they're like, well, why? Well, I don't mean to offend you, but that is not God. Let me share with you who God is. And we'll see later on the the restraints that the gospel puts on our preaching. Because there is, there's a way to do this biblically and that'll come up later. But like you take henna art, right? And it's very popular down in India. Henna art literally comes from the myth of Baal and Anath. And it's a wedding ritual. It's a warrior ritual that has to do with um, fertility, the changing of the seasons, the thunder God, um, Women hennaed their hands in connection with a spring fertility sacrifice festival. And the goddess Anna hennaed in connection with a harvest victory celebration. These times were appropriate for henna use as henna put out new growth in the spring. As the season warmed, the rains returned at the end of the fall. Baal, the bull god, was identified with the thunder and the life-giving rain. Anna, his sister and consort, was a fertility goddess and a virgin warrior goddess. In myth cycle, Baal was killed by Mat, the god of summer heat. When Baal was killed, the rain stopped throughout the summer drought, right? So this, from their own websites, the henna people's websites, that cat, this is um, hennapage.com is one of the leading blog sites about the histories and the tradition of this henna practice. And they're saying that the earliest form of henna goes back to the Bronze Age, and it has to do with Baal and Anath. So now you tell me what possible justification a Christian would have for knowingly marking themselves this way. Because these henna artists, right, these henna artists that um, work for Christ Alignment, you're telling me that they never studied henna, but yet they call themselves henna artists? They don't know the origin of henna, that it's mystically for Baal. You see, the Bible tells us specifically that we're not to learn the ways of the heathen, correct? Nor are we to promote them, nor are we to mix ourselves or profane ourselves with them. You see, the the Bible never promises that we have to be all things to all men in, in, in the fact of compromising our stance. Like Paul said, he tried to be all things to all men, but he would not compromise the core values of the gospel. He would not compromise the message that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life, and the only way to get the Father. And later on, when we we break down their um their golden their golden ticket sort of scripture that they love to pull out any time that they do things like this, we're going to see exactly how Paul dealt with being a missionary in a foreign country, in a place that was fully given to idols. And it'll, it'll blow your mind because there's no clearer picture of this than what's found in scripture and the way that Paul did it. And Paul left us that example, right? Justin, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. That's right. Commanded to follow the acts of the apostles, not these modern day flaky apostles, but the legitimate ones that were commissioned by Christ. Let's get back to the cards for a second. 
Uh, I did a little bit of homework on this, and I found out that um, it's it's very common. There's this common practice using tarot cards as a Christian. Like I, I know, I know you're hearing this, and you're like, okay, what? Well, this makes no sense. How could a Christian actually use tarot cards? Well, they can't. Okay, there's really no such thing as a Christian tarot card. Um, and, and if you're a Christian, you would really come under conviction if you even came near these things. So if somebody's operating in these things, claiming to be of Christ, then they are a liar and they are really not of Christ. So I want to go ahead and get that out there. But here's a book. It's called Signs and Wonders, Tarot Cards for Christians. And right there on the cover, it's got a picture of the temperance card. Um, It's got a subtitle here, a high, A-H-Y-H, a high, the church of Yahweh www.yhwh.com. Now, it's funny because uh, the ongoing debate amongst Hebrew rooters is YHWH or YHVH, right? I think we've all mm-hmm. probably seen the debate on Facebook. It's ridiculous. Totally ridic. Um, I, I got to quit using these like abbreviations. I, people I work with, they do this all the time. Like, totally ridic. Obvi. I'm sorry. I'm so retarded. (laughs) Thanks, Joe and Josh. Josh Peck, he's the worst. Him and his wife. Josh and his wife, it's always like these half words. Anyway, it just, it it grows on you and and you don't want it to, but (laughs) okay. (laughs) So this book, right? Signs and Wonders, Tarot Cards for Christians, Total Hebrew Roots, Total Hebrew Roots, getting into the sacred names. Um, But here's the description. It says, there are countless books about the tarot available. Or tarot, okay, I get it. Some people say tarot, tarot, whatever, okay? There are countless books about the tarot available. Most tell how to read fortunes in the cards. Signs and Wonders is different. Now, interestingly, I want to stop here. Signs and Wonders, it's funny that they use the term signs and wonders because this is the undergirding basis of the New Apostolic Reformation. Signs and Wonders. This is what people come to church for at Bethel. This is what people come to church for at IHOP. This is why people come to these New Apostolic Festivals and these these conferences they call them these these uh, one thing conferences and and all you know they come because they want the signs and wonders they come to the Todd Bentley and the John Crowder meetings because they want the signs and they want the wonders okay so signs and wonders the book seeks to reclaim the tarot card from fortune tellers and occult practices okay now uh, how do you reclaim something that would mean that you actually owned it they're actually these people have the gall to say, this Hebrew root guy, he has the gall to say that tarot cards actually belong to God and that they have been hijacked by the fortune tellers and occultists. And so the purpose of this book is to redeem the tarot cards from past and present abuses and explain the rich symbolism of the tarot and unveil the divine and biblically consonant revelation the tarot cards transmit. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, when, when I'm, I'm laughing and it's not like it's funny. Like I'm laughing at how res, uh, just res stupid. Is that, is that a nicer word than retarded? Res stupid? Th- this is res stupid. Okay. This guy is telling us that tarot cards are actually gods. They're divine and they're biblical. And they bring about God's revelation. They transmit God's revelation. But the occult and the New Agers have stolen them from God, and we've got to reclaim them. You know, and, and, and at what point did this guy deny Jesus, right? Right. At what point did he get so engulfed in the in the OE that we call uh, Hebrew Roots Movement that he decided to totally deny Jesus? I mean, come on, people. He's wanting to reclaim tarot cards. And he's saying here that if you have ever looked at a tarot card deck and you felt an unusual curiosity— or you had the strange feeling there was something more to the illustrations on the cards than what meets the eye. This book is for you. So what he's doing, he's trying to literally get your attention, and he's trying to teach you that these things are of God, that we need to reclaim tarot cards for God. I don't even know if we have time to read the reviews. Like you, I'm, people, you can go to Amazon, ladies and gentlemen, and you can look these things up. The reviews are going to make you sick. Like people are praising these people. People are praising this book. I mean, and and, and they actually explain that this is like helping them in their walk with God. 
They're being illuminated. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is sick. They talk about getting out their decks. They're getting out their decks of tarot cards and learning how they are God related and how to use them for the glory of God. Like that's that's the gist of of of, of this whole movement. In closing, I just want to move on from this, but I, I just this whole Hebrew roots guy. I, I just want to go ahead and nail this in the coffin, okay? Pastor Ahai describes himself as a Christian Kabbalist. He has been a student of the Bible. Apparently not, okay? He's not the student of the Bible, but he claims to be a student of the Bible since the early 70s, and he has a degree in the world's religions from Chapman University. I'm sure they're very proud of him. He is the webmaster and the primary contributor to GodsWebsite.com, established in 1996 as one of the first web-based churches. Pastor Ahai and his wife, Libby Maxey, Libby Maxey, say that three times fast, they live near Nashville, Tennessee with their son and their three cats. That's his official bio. Christian Kabbalist. We got to move on. If you want to look further into this, you can go to godswebsite.com. That's www.godswebsite.com. Godswebsite.com or www.yhwh.com. That's that there that's what's published on the cover of this book. I don't know. I haven't gone to check it out. I don't know if they're still running these websites. Bottom line is this is the movement. Okay? Destiny cards are really no different than tarot cards. They're no different than soothsaying, which the Bible says don't do. Don't soothsay. Don't fortune tell. Don't try to give somebody a reading of their past, present, or future. That is not for you to do. Completely, completely reprimanded by Scripture, forbidden in Scripture. Now, we have this other thing called oracle cards. I think this is kind of important because oracle cards are dealing with oracles, obviously, which is really nothing that much different than a fortune. But we've got a book written by Doreen Virtue, PhD, and, and, and oh, you're going to love Doreen Virtue, but she wrote a book called Healing with the Angels, okay? So you can be healed. Now, this gets into the whole angel fascination with the New Apostolic Reformation, angels showing up in services, angel feathers flying down, gold dust. You know, uh, Todd Bentley, Todd Bentley calling down the angels. Uh, some of you may remember the video. It's like the drums are playing like this, this really crazy beat. And Todd Bentley and all the people, he's leading them in this worship chant. And they're like, angels, angels, angels. I, did we did we play that clip, BDK, back in the day? Did we play him like calling down the angels? No, but it's a famously viewed clip. And it's pretty much exactly how you're describing it. It's scary. Like, it is so scary. Like, these people are chanting angels. You know, and, and Todd claims to have had, um, you know, uh, what what, did he, what was it, uh, what was the name of his angel that he was visited by? Uh, he claims that his angel, Emma, Emma, was the same angel that ministered alongside of William Branham that gave William Branham all of his power. Oh, yeah, William Branham, the guy that loved the Jews so much that he calls them hook noses. Yep. Think we remember a hook nosed Jew, William Branham? I think we all remember him. I, I tell you, BDK, you pretty much, uh, pretty much ruined my day. <laughs> like I'm listening to that podcast and I'm like, you have ruined my day. Like, like, thank you for ruining my night. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. And this is the guy, William Branham, but, um, the angels, this fascination with angels, it goes right into these cards, these Oracle cards, healing with the angels, um, and, and this, it comes with a book and 44 cards in the deck. So this is another type of deck. I mean, what we're dealing with these cards, different types of cards. Christ alignment has different types of cards. Everybody puts out their own cards. Tell us about this healing with the angels. Tell us about the, the Dorian virtue and the healing with the angels and the Oracle cards. Well, it's kind of crazy because you show like pictures of these cards, right? And they look very much like tarot cards. They have guardian angel retreat, surrender and release enchantment on it and it says like your guardian angels have messages that can help you heal every area of your life this set of 44 oracle cards will help you communicate with your angels and receive angelic answers and guidance so it's like and we're not we're not like uh just kind of pulling this lady out of random like in the review, it says Doreen Virtue is the undisputed queen of the angel scene. 
She's a best-selling author, right? She's a doctor of psychology and a Christian who studies the scriptures. Well, what scriptures is she studying, Justin? Like, I find this highly, highly suspect because a lot of this ties back, like you said, to the, the Kabbalah, this ancient Hebrew mysticism, this idea that the language and the words of God are so powerful, they have creative forces to a And it's an understanding of all of these uh, powerful sentences. And I believe in my heart of hearts, the reason that we're seeing this happen in this age, this uh, Kabbalahistic um, infiltration, for lack of a better words, is because I believe the Antichrist is going to be a Jew who believes in the Kabbalah. The book of Daniel says that he's a man of understanding of dark sentences, and I believe that is exactly what the Kabbalah is. And I believe this Jewish mysticism is going to be a fulcrum point, not only to suck in the New Agers, the New Apostolic Reformation, but also the Hebrew Roots Movement people. And it's going to cast a very wide net because it's going to sound like scripture. They're going to use scripture sounding terms, but in reality... It's nothing more than a dark, twisted word of faith sort of concept. It is. And and these people run around acting like they've been enlightened. I I think that's the the persona that they carry is that they have been enlightened in a way that we haven't. And so we need to read their books. We need to go through their therapy sessions, their destiny card readings, their angel therapy. You know, and Doreen Virtue, she's a best-selling author. Clearly, she's been on the Oprah show, but a big surprise there, right? She's been on the Oprah show, CNN, the BBC. She's been on The View, Good Morning America. She's been featured in newspapers and magazines worldwide. And if you want more information on Doreen Virtue, visit her at angeltherapy.com. Angeltherapy.com. I mean, come on. This this is insane. Her cards look very similar to Destiny cards. She's claiming to be a Christian. Sorry, I'm, I've got a lemon head in my mouth. Can you can you tell that I'm eating candy right now, BDK? A little bit. <laughs> I just need something for my throat. So uh, th- th- this is just it, it's crazy because all these things. It's like you, you go to Christ Alignment and then you just you start looking around and you find out that this is not just Christ Alignment. This is like literally entering in everywhere with all these different people online that have churches and ministries. This next one is really crazy, actually. And we've got two books by William Alexander Orabello. The first one is called Bible Spells. Yeah, yeah, Bible Spells. Obtain your every desire. That kind of sounds like the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, does it not? Your every desire? <laughs> kind of the very thing. Or a Paul- Joel Olstein sermon. <laughs> Seriously, like I'm, I'm, I'm just like, how is this guy even? Bible spells obtain your every desire by activating the secret meaning of hundreds of Bible verses. So apparently, Bible spells are encrypted into this, and this goes right back to the whole Hebrew roots secret word inside the Bible. The Bi- and he he says more important than the Bible code. That's like the back cover headline. Ancient magic with a K. Yep. We're getting into Aleister Crowley here. Yep. Ancient magic with a K. He says ancient magic techniques using secret power verses from the holy scriptures to gain enlightenment, health, good fortune, and prosperity. These easy to perform spiritual spells will have a deep impact on your life and those of your loved ones. Man. I mean, look, you can read this book. And learn Bible spells on love and romance. Now, what's interesting is this takes us right back to Christ alignment. Does it not? Are we not going full circle here? Do you guys remember some of the things we said about the Christ alignment website? Love and romance? Money and business success? I mean, (laughs) I'm just saying. Like, these are things that that have been kind of hinted at in Destiny cards on their own website. But this guy is saying these are Bible spells and love and romance, money, business, success, achieving good luck, removing bad luck and curses, protection of your home and loved ones, health, healing and happiness, health, healing and and, and happiness. I mean, goodness, these are things that they boast about with the destiny cards and the destiny readings. 
Here's a good one. There are Bible spells to receive divine grace and mercy. I got a better one. Why don't you just accept Jesus Christ? Amen. Why don't we just call upon the name of Jesus and be saved? Because it's through Jesus Christ that we receive the only divine grace and mercy. But no, this guy, William Alexander Orabello, is telling us that he has found the secret to unlocking the secret meaning of 100 Bible verses and that they are actually spells. Well, what's even more messed up is in this very same back book, it says, beginning with his childhood, William Orbello experienced contact with divine forces in the forms of angel beings and ascended masters. These spiritual contacts taught him the secret of the creative force and how we can all utilize special power verses from the Holy Bible, along with ordinary candles, incense, crystals, gemstones for luck, love, and well-being. And this is where I'm calling shenanigans on the whole thing, Justin, because when I came to Christ, the awesome thing about Christ is that he gave me all of himself on Calvary. And when I received Christ, a divine exchange took place, his life for mine. When I received Jesus, I received all of healing. When I received Jesus, I received all of the fullness of love. When I received Jesus, I received every promise of the Bible. When I received Jesus, I received every bit of him. I didn't receive part of him or a bit here and a bit there. And I sure as heck didn't need Jesus plus I don't need Jesus plus candles. I don't need Jesus plus incense. I don't need Jesus plus crystals. I don't need Jesus plus gemstones for luck, love, and well-being. Either Christ is all-sufficient or he is not. And what really trips me out, what really makes me so upset is all these people They sit around with all these cards and all these candles and all these crystals. And like that one woman in the Amazon review, she was like, prayer time used to be so horrible for me. But now I can sit back and put down the tarot cards and deeply investigate the things of God. Christians can't pray for more than five minutes in today's society without their minds wandering off into foolishness, fantasy, and just bunk in general. Christians can't pray for 15 minutes or an hour. That's why they don't show up to prayer meetings anymore, because they can't pray. But what we really need is all these gimmicks to make it so that we have time to pray. Like, it's not enough to pray and call on the holy name of Jesus. No, we got to slap down cards, too. Because we can't spend five minutes training our mind to be still in the presence of God and to know that he is holy. And it's just messed up. Because if you think you need anything other than Jesus, then you are wrong. And the sad fact is Jesus is all you will ever, ever need. And if you would investigate that truth for yourself and you would spend time pressing into Jesus You would find something that would put all of these gimmicks to shame. You would find a pearl beyond price, a peace that passes all understanding that guards and keeps your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yeah, and and, and to call these gimmicks, like like I want to say I agree. These are these are being used as gimmicks, um, especially by Christ alignment. You know, they're they're trying to claim that these are um, merely gimmicks that they're using to appeal to the New Age movement. But in reality, it's so much more than a gimmick because these are actual real satanic rituals and practices that really do tap into the other dimensions. These are really tapping into the spirit realm. These are literally inviting in spirits, opening up people as vessels to demonic possession, bringing about soothsaying sessions. They're literally bringing about uh, even and they admit this on a destiny card website uh, on the Christ alignment website you know, past, present, and future in their readings. You know, and, and, and Roman Catholics, you know, uh, and, and this is not to sit here and pick on, on uh, you know, any particular person. This is about what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. And Catholics, uh, depending on how devout you are, you know, you get into the whole candle, lighting a candle for this, a candle for that, a candle for this, a candle for that. And, you know, the, the same guy, the same guy that just wrote that Bible spells book, He wrote a book called Candle Burning Magic with the Psalms. 
ironically, we got the destiny card folks at Christ Alignment doing psalm readings, psalm card readings. He says you can create life's greatest blessings by combining the power of the holy psalms with the magic of burning different colored candles. A hundred and over 150 proven rituals. These are rituals that have been proven in their magic ceremonies to work. All you need to fulfill your innermost desires, dreams, and wishes is a match, an ordinary candle, incense, and the ability to recite a specific psalm from Scripture. And then they go on to say that the Scripture teaches that it is far better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. Also includes instructions on the right times to perform the most successful rituals and what colored candles to use. Look, this is crossed over even with Peter Popoff. Maybe I'll replay the episode I did with Mary Callie a couple years ago. I talk about the care packages that I was getting in the mail from Peter Popoff. You know, he was sending me all these magical little trinkets and talismans and satanic little paraphernalia, asking me to donate money to his, his, if you even want to call it a ministry. Peter Popoff is a joke. I only called the number so that I, I wanted to get on his mailing list because I wanted I literally, I saw him giving away all this satanic stuff on TV for free. I was like, well, I want to get some of that satanic stuff so that I can use it as a, as a witnessing tool to people. And before I knew it, I mean, months and months and months, he'd be sending me these giant envelopes, like overflowing with crap. I mean, like, I mean, crazy stuff, like everything from colored yarn that you're supposed to wrap around your fingers and wrap around your wrist. I mean, it's, it's voodoo. Peter Popoff is literally getting you to practice voodoo in your home under the guise of Christianity. It's like Christian Kabbalah. I mean, it's really no different than that. And different color candles that you're supposed to light in your home. And they're like those little mini cupcake candles because he's on a budget. So so he (laughs) sends you these little cupcake candles of different colors and each one represents a different meaning. And so you light the one that's different. You know, you got green, blue, red, different colors. And I don't, they're somewhere packed away. I think they got crushed in the move. But regardless, these candles, they, they, (laughs) This is voodoo. You like this one for this meaning. You like that one for that meaning. And and here we go. We, we've got this guy, the same guy, William Orabello, teaching psalm magic, candle psalm magic, teaching Bible spells. I mean, th- this is ridiculous. Now, I, I just want to make this, this one quick statement here. There is a review on Amazon, and, and this is telling. This is really telling, okay? Uh, this one review I want to hit only because... The name of the reviewer, th- this is this is just going to take it home. The name of the reviewer is Occult Review. Occult Review. So the guy's raising his hand saying, I'm an occultist. Pick me, pick me. I'm an occultist. And this is what the occultist had to say about this Bible satanic book review. For those that are looking to combine their more orthodox Christian beliefs with occult and metaphysics, we highly recommend this book. Orabello is one of the top sagas of magic and spiritism, which is followed by millions in Brazil. This book will do much for those seeking to draw positive blessings to themselves. Occult review. So he's he's admitting that if if you're from the Orthodox Christian background of some type, that this book is going to teach you how to combine occult and metaphysics with your Christianity. And this, this author... This author, Orabello, he is a popular practitioner of spiritism. I've done shows on spiritism way back in the early days of the Fourth Watch. I don't even know if they're on the Fourth Watch network. This is going all the way back to when I was doing shows on the Kapow network. But I did did shows on spiritism. It's massive in Brazil, right in line with what that occult review said. But basically, he's explaining the whole about me section uh, his work includes Bible spells, sealed book of Moses, <laughs> master book of spiritual power, sacred magic, count St. Germain, the man who lives forever. And what's interesting about count St. Germain, the man that lives forever, <laughs> apparently Orabello claims that he has channeled this guy. This is Unbelievable. I mean, and this is so close to what's going on at Bethel in Christ alignment. And, and people, you could sit back and say, you're really stretching this. No, I'm not. I found these books only after Christ alignment. 
I started digging into to the practices that Christ Alignment was getting into and how that they were repackaging New Age, giving it a whole new makeover, a new facelift, and I found these books. I found them. Now, let's just go ahead and nail something out real fast. There's no such thing as a Bethel board. Many people are saying that, well, you know, there's, there's a Bethel board. It's basically a Ouija board that they use at Bethel Church, and, you know, they're using it to communicate with angels. Um, that's kind of not true. Actually, it's completely not true. There's no such thing as a Bethel board. And look, I, I think Bethel is a, is a heresy house, okay? It's a, it's a circus of crazy spiritual behavior. But I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that there's a Bethel board. There's absolutely no Bethel board. We just need to kind of get that out there. It's kind of deceptive because when all these pictures were surfacing, there was a picture of an angel board, an, an the angel speaks board. And a lot of people started to assume that Bethel was promoting those boards, you know, I mean, hey, look, we all saw the pictures. They were surfacing the internet, they're circulating, but there's really no connection there other than the people that are operating the boards are pretty much doing the same thing that they're doing when they're operating the, the, the cards. It's literally using a medium to communicate with entities in another realm, whether they're calling it the third heavens, whether they're calling it the spirit realm, the ethereal plane. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a board or if it's cards. It doesn't matter. It's all seance. BDK? Yeah, it's true, man. And I think we should dive right into the Bethel controversy since we've hit it, because now there's going to be a lot of people that are really upset because they're going to say, well, we appreciate the fact, Justin, that you went to bat for Bethel and you put the kibosh on the rumor that they were using uh, angel boards. But are they really, truly, you know, because a lot of people are going to say that they're distancing themselves from these cards and that even Chris Van or Von, ah, I have so much trouble saying his name. Valaton. Valaton. <laughs> right. There was a point where when he first heard about this, he was like, no shenanigans. We're not a part of this. And then it's like, well, yeah, we kind of are. And then like this whole thing blew up and then Bethel had to make official statements about it on their website. Valaton is probably one of the more popular guys out there that, that gets a lot of uh, shares and quotes. A lot of people like to follow his blog and they like to talk about him and what he does and what he says. People probably quote him more than they quote Jesus. I mean, that's that. unfortunately, that's how people do. They would rather quote one of these pastors. And there's a lot of good people out there that follow his blog. You know, people are people are hungry and they're looking for somebody to follow. And I think that's one of the problems that we have here is that people are seeking after these men and when the man puts a stamp of approval on it, all of his followers just rejoice. Oh, hallelujah. Christ alignment must be good. Praise God. Christ alignment. Christ alignment. Valaton says they're good. That's what this is. People sound the trumpets. They start having parties, sending gifts to family members. You know, Christ alignment's good. The Pope's a man of God. He reads his Bible. You know, thanks to Mike Bickle, we can all go home now. Thanks to IHOP and Mike Bickle. We can all go home now because the Pope is a man of God. I just don't get, oh man, I don't want to backtrack. I, I just, it, it's, it's all so stupid. It's so deceptive. Well, I think that's the problem, Justin. It's deception, right? I mean, either it's wrong or it's not wrong. Either it's they are aligned with these guys or they're not. Either they promote what they do or, and stand by what they do. Or they don't. Why do they keep changing their stance? Why do they keep being purposefully vague about things? Like, are we called to deal in these semantics? Or should we let our yes be yes and our no be no? Or should we be like, Jesus, I've done nothing in secret. I, I have kept nothing from you. It's like they themselves, by their obfuscating the their stance, kind of, you know, are showing that even they know that this is dangerous because let's be honest, man, it's kind of crazy that we're doing this show. Like this is like kindergarten level discernment stuff. Like if you can't discern that this kind of stuff is new age and occultic and just slapping Jesus on it, then you're in for a whole lot of trouble when the deception gets really thick coming up real soon. These are pastors of mega churches. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like how these people are supposed to be trusted as leaders. 
I mean, th- these are literally people who are, who are standing up and they're saying, I've gone to Bible school. I've been called by God into the ministry and I'm going to preach to thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, not only in the United States, but worldwide. That's how, that's how wide spanning these ministries are. Hundreds of thousands of followers. We should not have to be changing their diapers. You know, and, and I don't care if you like Bill Johnson. I don't care if he's preached a message that ministered to your life, okay? A broken clock is going to be right twice a day. You know, I'm so sick of people saying, oh, well, he spoke to, he spoke a message right to my heart. You know, or God used him to speak to me. Hey, look, God spoke through a donkey. God can speak through me for crying out loud. And I'm a nobody. I have a problem when you've got a guy standing up on a pulpit like this, him and Chris Valaton and Mike Bickle and these other guys, and they've got such a huge following and a huge audience that nobody even cares to validate, to test what they're saying from the pulpit because they believe that they've got revelation from God, just like Mormons do. And so when they come up with this revelation or they have a vision or they have a dream or they have a word of prophecy or the Lord reveals something to them, again, these are what they're claiming. I'm not saying that God really does this with them. This is what they're claiming. People listen to it, and they believe it, they chew it up, they digest it, and they accept it as gospel. We should not be having to wipe their butts and change their diapers. These are grown men in positions of authority in the church. Yet they are sitting here pampering people, filling their ears with falseness, filling their ears with deception. And propagating the satanic infiltration of the last day's church, the apostate church. And here we are just trying to proclaim the gospel. Just trying to tell people it's so simple. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. You don't have to get into the mysticism. You don't, you don't need to play with these things. I mean, uh, do we even have to tell you that it's wrong to look at porno? No, everybody knows. Okay. Yeah, porno's wrong. Okay, it makes sense. It's wrong. Well, so is mysticism. A kid knows it is wrong to steal candy from the gas station. You know, and, and these are adults that should know that mysticism is satanic and that it is literally an abomination unto the Lord. And yet people want to defend Bill Johnson. People want to defend Chris Valaton. You know, I, I remember I was talking to Jeff. I'm, I'm going to go here. I wasn't going to go here. I was talking to Jeff one day, you know, and, and we're talking about the NAR and I'm warning him that he's getting real close to the fire. You know, he's getting real close. And I don't mean the good fire. Um, I was warning him about some of these things. And he says, you know, it's funny because somebody really just tore into me because I quoted Chris Valaton on my blog. And I said, wait, what? You quoted Chris Valaton? And yeah, yeah, of course I did. Why? You have a whole Bible to quote from. Why are you quoting Chris Valaton? A guy who's now standing up and and, and acting like these destiny cards are good. A guy who's partnering up with Christ Alignment. You know, uh, why are you quoting this guy? I'm here to tell you guys, it doesn't matter who your pastor is. It doesn't matter how long you've known him for. It doesn't matter who claims to be your brother in Christ or who doesn't. You have a responsibility for your own soul. Before the Lord Jesus Christ, you are to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. You need to know what's right, and you need to know how to live it out and how to walk it out. The the, the gospel is simple. Call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first thing you do is you call upon his name. You understand that you're a sinner and that you need Christ. And then you start growing. God will, will, he will mold you. He will give you discernment. He will start to shape you up. And to the man or woman that he has literally created you to be in Christ. But what's going to happen is the world is going to continue to come your way. Like all the stuff that you can't get away from, the mysticism, uh, the the movies, the music, uh, the peer pressure, the influences of the world. And you've got to be able to take that stuff and rightly divide what is okay and what's not okay. And when you find out that a pastor, your pastor, or or somebody who you like to read their books, or you like to read their devotion, or something like that, you have to come to the point where when they start teaching heresy and mysticism, that you go ahead and just mark them out and leave. 
exit the room, quit listening to them, quit quoting them, quit reading their books, quit listening to their sermons on the radio, quit going to their church, quit promoting them in any and every aspect. Yes, pray for them, but mark them out so that others don't fall into these traps and these snares as well. So there's no excuse to be quoting Chris Vallotton anymore. There's no excuse to be quoting Bill Johnson unless you're exposing the the lies and the heresy that they teach. And I don't care if it's, if it's good intentions that, you know, somebody used to tell me that the path to hell, the road to hell, the highway to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, what's really crazy about that BDK. The guy that told me that years ago is now slipping down a slope into some of this stuff. Yeah, we're living in bad times, dude. Unless you know the truth, dude, you are very, very, very prone to deception. I don't want anybody to be deceived by this stuff. I don't. You know, I I really, truly want people to see this for what it is. I don't want Chris Valaton to be deceived. I don't know the guy. Uh, and, and I don't want Bill Johnson to be deceived, but honestly, like when you, when you find out that there's people bashing the adults, okay, adults are bashing each other in the head with a puppet at a church service at Bill Johnson's church and he's there and everything's just kosher. I mean, that tells you right there, the spiritual maturity of the leadership at that church. It's unacceptable. You know, in the Bethel witch, we've talked about the Bethel witch. The girl that, that says she got born again, the born again witch, but she's still a practicing witch. She got prophesied over at Bethel. You know, and this is not here to pick a fight with Bethel. We've already talked about Bethel plenty in the past. But people still want to stand up on their social media platforms and declare that Bethel is good. Oh, you don't understand. Bethel is doing good. They're becoming all things to all men for the sake of Christ Jesus. A lot of people are going to say, we agree with you, but um, what about Acts seventeen twenty two through 34? And they're going to even quote Bill Johnson because his official Bethel Church statement about this whole Christ alignment stuff quotes that. He writes, the Hodges are attempting to contextualize the gospel and bring people to the realization that God is looking for them and loves them no matter where they are, just like the apostle Paul often did. Okay, so they're talking about Ken and Jenny Hodge, who are the people that basically do all these new age festivals and are part of this Christ alignment, right? They're the, they're the mom and dad of Ben Fitzgerald, right? Who is um, part of the Bethel movement. Now, Bill Johnson says, Paul spoke to a group of religious people who didn't yet know God and lived in a city full of altars, idols in various regions. In that moment, Paul referred to a singular altar in their city that had an inscription to the unknown God. He used this familiar object, something they understood and valued as a starting point to connect them with the God of all creation. And basically every time that they use this scripture, they're saying, well, Paul preached a sermon. He went undercover. He, this was his starting point. He used the familiar object. Like if these people are familiar with tarot cards, we're going to give them the Christian version of it something that they understand and value as a starting point to introduce them into God. Basically, these guys are like doing the Mars Hills evangelism role. And you can find that really, really um, plainly if you go to one of their sister websites, the BSSM or the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry School Planting website. This website has a story from a student who went on one of these new age outreaches. And I quote from their website, I ministered undercover at a psychic fair. We offered dream interpretations, healings, and spirit readings. Sadly, many of the attendees had been hurt by Christians in the church. So we used language that was not religious or would cause them to put up walls. We built rapport with them by just loving them. They eventually figured out we were Christian, but without us saying anything. To reach the people at the psychic fair, we did not say Jesus, God, or Holy Spirit. Instead, we called God the Spirit of Creation. A young man came into our booth for a spirit reading. I asked him if he would mind if I invited the Spirit of Creation into the tent, and he said that that would be okay. After we prayed, we ministered to him with a bongo and a maraca. 
person I ministered with began to shake and wave the maraca over the young man's head while I pounded out the most spiritual sounding beat on the bongo that my rhythmically challenged hands could manage. Now, is there an account of Jesus or his disciples meeting anyone in the Bible and doing this? When someone came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I'm demon possessed, or Jesus, I'm sick, or Jesus, I need healing, did he gather his disciples in a drum circle and say, you know what, we're going to chant for 20 minutes, sing the same word of God, the name of God, over for 25 minutes, over and over and over again until you get in an altered state of consciousness. We're going to bang on the drums, maybe put a little incense over you, and then an hour later, dude, we're just going to heal you. That's not what Jesus did. The disciples must even be more upset over this. I mean, imagine this, Justin, like them sitting up in heaven right now going, you know, all those times that we were told never to preach in the name of Jesus. And now we could have just gone undercover and never used your name at all, but instead played maracas and drums and called you the spirit of creation. We could have just gathered a bunch of band equipment Dude, we all got, you're using your name, got us all killed, except for John. And John's like, well, to be fair, I was dipped in oil over the whole situation, right? And if it was okay for them to do that, they could have done it. You, we, we could have seen the book of Acts of them going all undercover, but that's not what happened. I mean, that, that's what the Jews wanted. The Jews wanted them to quit using the name Jesus. But now that's the ministry model, right? But here's the thing. Well, what about this Paul and the unknown God? He didn't, he was so undercover that he didn't use the name Jesus once. Well, now let's look at this passage and let's examine that to see if it's true. I'm going to start at Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the whole city given wholly over to idolatry. Now, notice that when he sees that the whole city is wholly given over to idolatry, and that means the occult. What happens? His spirit is stirred in him. What that word stirred means, it was aroused to grief and anger. It was provoked. It was irritated. It cut at him. It means to burn with emotion, to stimulate, to spur on, to urge. It's a deep groaning. When he sees all this occult shenanigans around him, it just, it makes him both angry, not at the people, but angry at the devil. And this system of slavery and deception that he has these people under. And basically, he's like, I'm going to war with these dudes. This is the same sort of thing you read in the accounts of Jesus, where it would often talk about Jesus being moved or groaning with compassion when he healed or cast out devils. This was a motivation factor. So his motivation is against the occult and the idolatry of this city. And he looks around and he sees all these altars, all these different gods, and he's upset. And he's like, I must help these people who are lost. Let's go to verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans, the Stoics, encountered him. And some say, what will this babbler say? Others some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange God. Now listen to this. Because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. So before he does any of this Mars Hill stuff, before he does any of this unknown God sermon that Bill Johnson claims is the starting point, he has already been explicitly going around the town, talking to the Stoics and the Epicureans, and explicitly using the name Jesus, and talking about the resurrection. Okay? Catch that. Not undercover. Then it says this, he stands in front of that one statue marked to the unknown God. What does he say? God that made the world and all things therein, seeing the, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is he worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything. Basically, this God does not need anything that you can make with your hands to be a worship model or a ministry model seeing as he giveth all things, all breath and life to all things. In him we live, we move, and have our being. 
As certain also of your poets once said, for we are also his offspring. For as much as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver, stones, or graven art made by man's device. So how are you going to sit back and say that you make these destiny art cards for the glory of God to spread the gospel? You also like using your gold, your silver, your stones, your candle magic, your henna art, and all this other stuff. And you're going to quote Paul, who's sitting back and saying, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto anything that be, can be portrayed by gold, silver, stone, or graven. Now that, when you see graven by art, that's talking about fortune telling. That's talking about destiny cards. That's talking about all this stuff. So how ballsy do you have to be to quote this is the reason for making these destiny calls? And Paul is like, this is not how we are to represent God. And then he finishes by prophesying gold to them, right? That's the term that Bethel likes to use. Um, if you read the letter by Teresa Dedman, who Bill Johnson also quotes, um, she says that she uses the destiny cards to prophesy gold to people. Chris Gore, who is um, one of the people who is in charge of the supernatural healing school in walking in supernatural healing power, his book says that it's his job to always prophesy gold to people. It doesn't take any prophetic discernment to prophesy dirt in people. God's always in a good mood and God shows up when you prophesy good things to good people. So that's what Paul does, right? In this Mars Hill thing. No, this is how he ends his sermon. And at the times of ignorance, God winked at, but now commendeth all men everywhere to repent because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, wherefore he hath given assurance unto all men that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, if this was just the starting off point, all those people would have been confused and the riot wouldn't have happened that preceded this message. But why did things get out of hand? Because they knew exactly who he was talking about when he started talking about the resurrection. Because in verse 18, he was already preaching unto them Jesus and the resurrection. You could say that this sermon, he was mocking this unknown altar. He wasn't being a seeker under, you know, undercover evangelist. He was basically taunting or calling shenanigans on their idolatry and their mystic arts. Now, what's even more crazy is that if you want to model your ministry after Paul and you really want to be fair, please go back one chapter in your Bible. Just flip the page backward one. And you're going to come to this story. And it came to pass as he went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this she did many days. But Paul being grieved, there we go again, that motivation turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Cyrus, drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach us customs, which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. And then the multitudes rose up together against them. The magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. So here is Paul in the midst of an occult marketplace or an occult festival, just like these Destiny's Card people, when they're at their New Age festivals, where they sell their New Age books and crystals and readings and whatnot, and he hears a demon basically endorsed them and his pals are like, Hey, that's not cool. Now, if, if this was Bill Johnson and his crew, if these were the destiny card crew, they'd be like, Hey, these new agers are endorsing us. How awesome. We're doing our job. We just got endorsed by a famous psychic. This is going to help us fit in. Great. What is Paul? No, Paul is grieved, grieved in his spirit. And if you read most commentaries on this passage, he is he is casting out this devil because 
their occult customs. He did not want anyone blending in the occult with Christianity. As a matter of fact, when he entered the New Age marketplace, he didn't want anyone to think that they were in league. So he cuts it down. He he casts the devil out, and the girl loses his power, and everyone is losing money. And then they end up being beaten and chained up in prison. Now, this is not undercover evangelism, people. There are certain parameters of the gospel preaching and outreach in scriptures. Jeremiah 10, 12, or Jeremiah 10, 2, Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. That's talking about divination and astrology. We're to go into the, to the world and we're to preach the gospel to every person. Doesn't say we have to do play maracas or or um we don't have to prophesy only gold. Like Chris Gore quote actually says, and this is just the most blasphemous thing that a dude can say. He said, and this is how they teach these people to prophesy. When I prophesy, my role is to always bring out gold in people. I will never bring out the dirt. People already know their dirt. Why do they need me to reinforce it? It does not take much prophetic discernment to prophesy dirt, but it takes someone looking from God's perspective to see gold. Really? He's choosing what to prophesy. Well, no, here's what's really messed up about that. It doesn't take any prophetic insight to prophesy dirt. Really? Really? Because last time I checked in Revelation 9, 10, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. And in John 7, verse 7, Jesus said, The world cannot hate you, but it hateth me. Well, why does it hate you, Jesus? Because I testify of it that their works are evil. But that's not mystic enough, BDK. Well, yeah, you're not going to win very many people doing it that way. That's not esoteric enough. Obviously, Jesus doesn't have enough prophetic discernment, according to Bethel. Because he would go in there to these new age people like Paul did and start a riot and defund the place and cast out devils and heal the sick and preach the gospel, the uncompromising gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, he would be disturbed in his spirit. You see, there's a way that we win people to Christ, and it's very simple. It's a time-tested matter. It's law than gospel. It's law to the to the proud and grace to the humble. That's always been the way that it is. There's a reason that the law is before the gospel in your Bible. We present the law so that people can understand their need for a savior, so that they can see that they're going to hell, but there is a savior who can save them. It's like running into a a building and and pointing at one person and saying, it sucks that you have cancer. It's too bad you're going to die. Now, if I just met you two seconds ago, I'd be like, "Uh, who are you? And I have no idea what you're talking about. And the the guy's like, but that's cool because I got a cure for cancer in my back pocket. And you're like, well, you know, I don't know what you're talking about, sir. I don't have cancer. But if you were to say, the, my, I got this from the doctor's office. Is this your name? Yes, it is. Is this your file? Yes, it is. Well, it looks like you have cancer. And then you show the person that they medically have cancer. Now, the message of you have cancer, you're going to die, but I have a cure for cancer in my back pocket means a little something. But if you go to these occultic festivals, these new age festivals, and you do things just like everybody else is doing it, and you pump them all up that they're on the right path and that God loves them and their destiny is cool, even though they're involved in sin, and some of them are sitting naked across from you, then you're not giving anyone the chance to repent and believe the gospel. As Jesus said. So this whole thing is so whacked out. And so the next time somebody comes to you and says, well, this is what Paul did at Mars Hill. Take him back to the context of the scripture and then take him one verse back, one chapter back and show them what Paul did. Like I said before, we are to follow Paul as he followed Christ. The, 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 the words of the apostles were left to us as an example. 
but yet they're not good enough for us anymore. We must return back to truth because this NAR thing, it's not going away anytime soon. It's growing and it's growing more powerful. And even some of the people that have the best Bible knowledge in the world are getting hooked up in it. And it's truly sad. You know, I just want to add some insult to injury here. They charge people for this. Mm-hmm. Like they actually make money. Like they, they charge people. You're, you're paying to get your destiny read. You're paying to get to experience the third heaven realm. You're paying to find out what your spirit animal is or whatever, you know, your animal cards and your psalm readings. You're paying for this. Like, like you're, you're literally, you're going to a festival and you're paying for this. Um, and, and throughout their website, they're very clear that they, prof- they provide a service and they're paid. I mean, they're, they're, they're clients. You know, this is the feedback of our clients, our clientele, our clientele. They're paying for this. I want to point that out. The, the next thing I want to point out is they have a tab. I'm actually on their website right now. They've got a tab that says Amazing People. Click on it, and there's two, uh, two little drop downs. One of them is called Doof Sticks at Rainbow 2017, and one is called Drag Queens. Jenny and her husband are sitting here looking like they just got done taking a five foot bong rip and they're going to the drag queen festival, which you click on the link and all you do, I mean, there's just demons coming off the screen. I don't even want to look at it. They're calling these amazing people. They say many of the wonderful people who indeed are drag queens. <laughs> oh, they're calling drag queens amazing people. And they've got pictures of all of these demon-possessed, homosexual, queer lifestyle-living people. Scroll through their pictures of these amazing, wonderful, homosexual drag queens. They're just so amazing according to Christ's alignment. They're just so amazing. We want to put their pictures on our website. The bearded man with makeup, with a tutti-frutti hat. I mean, this is Sodom and Gomorrah, ladies and gentlemen. They're demonized. They need Christ. But instead of getting Christ, instead of getting the true gospel preached, they've got Christ alignment running around playing their card tricks and their parlor tricks, supporting their their, 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 their queer lifestyles and calling them amazing. And then on top of it, they're talking about these other amazing people that they met at the Rainbow Serpent Festival. It's a trance festival. And they're running around celebrating the occult celebrating the pagan rituals that take place at these festivals. It's like Burning Man. And I know what goes on at these places. Many of these places have orgy tents. We can just go in and have orgies. You give away drugs, you just trade drugs and ayahuasca and mind-altering substances. They're completely against the gospel. They open up your mind. We've done shows on this. And here's Christ's Alignment. Uh, you know, according to their letter that they submitted to Chris Vallotton, you know, they say that they are an undercover prophetic evangelism deliverance ministry. Well, they're so freaking undercover that I can't even tell that they're Christian. They're so undercover that they're reveling in sin and Sodom and Gomorrah rebellion. And you know what? When I look at the homosexual drag queen stuff, and then I and, and then I go over and I look at the New Age Rainbow Serpent Festival and all the people that they're celebrating over there, they're celebrating these alternative tribal lifestyles and paganism. Christ Alignment is celebrating all of this stuff. They're celebrating it on their website. And then we, we look over here at Chris Vallotton and Bill Johnson and, and Teresa Dedman, and they're all talking about how wonderful this ministry is. We don't go undercover for the gospel, okay? We don't stop using the name of God. We don't stop using the word of God, the Bible. And we surely don't run around and celebrate alternative lifestyles that will land someone in the flames of hell for eternity. Chris Vallotton on December 15th said, they are amazing people. Talking about this family that started Christ's alignment, the Hodges. The parents of Ben Fitzgerald, who's an active part of the Bethel family. Chris Vallotton calls Christ Alignment amazing people. Christ Alignment calls drag queens and tribal mystics amazing people. Pretty interesting little connection there. 
This is on the 15th of December. He explains that it's totally legit, that they support the ministry of Christ alignment. That's on the 15th. Then on December 19th, 2017, we have a Christmas critique of destiny cards on TeresaDeadman.com, where Teresa Deadman explains that she makes destiny cards too. And she's plugging her book, Born to Create. You know, what's dangerous about books like this is they probably have some truth in them mixed with a bunch of New Age mysticism. You know, and I got to be careful because I know a lot of people like Deadman, Teresa Deadman. They're like, oh, you know, we love Teresa Deadman. She's encouraged us, this, that, or the other. Well, look, if you've been encouraged by Teresa Deadman, and I know multiple people now who have told me that, you know, she's blessed them somehow. Look at it like this. God blesses you. Stop stop attributing that to people who are involved in wickedness. I don't care if you've had good past with her, if she's done good for you in the past. You need to recognize that Teresa Deadman is involved in the destiny card shenanigans. She's promoting the destiny cards. She's promoting Christ Alignment, has a link to their ministry on her website. Boasting that Christ Alignment is good. And then she's explaining that she uses destiny cards to share God's love. It's funny because at first Bethel was like, no, we don't have anything to do with these people. We don't have anything to do with destiny cards. It's a straight up lie, too, because that book, Born to Create, guess who wrote the foreword to it? Bill Johnson. And then secondly, I'll just quote you something from this book. This is an honest to God quote from her book, Born to Create, which in the endorsement, Chris Valentine's all like, this girl is awesome. She's like, this, this book's a prophetic manifest, a, a prophetic manifesto. It's inspiring another renaissance. Like he's just gushing all over it. And this is a quote from, from her book that, that is forwarded by Bill Johnson. She says, quote, supernatural creativity can impact people who are coming into your church for the first time. During the school year, I have the School of Ministry students sit at Bethel's welcome table and prophesy to newcomers through destiny cards, singing, and playing instruments over people. People, some for the first time, hear a love song from their Father in Heaven or receive a picture about God's thought for them which can radically transform their lives. Then there are so many other creative avenues to bless those who are looking to belong at our welcome center. So like, how are you going to tell me that these guys were like destiny cards? We didn't know that. And then that's not, we're loosely affiliated, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, uh, no, you're not Teresa Dedman. You guys are all gushing saying that this book's a prophetic manifest. That's going to inspire some sort of spiritual renaissance. Bill Johnson's forwarding the book. She's sitting there going like, yeah, I'm one of the directors at the School of Supernatural Ministry. And when people walk into the church, the very first thing that the the students do is use destiny cards. So why are they liars? Why are they deceivers? If they had the Holy Ghost in them, do you think the Holy Ghost would be deceptive? That he would lie? That he would deceive? This is just insane, dude. The proof's in the pudding. This is hand in the cookie jar. Caught red-handed stuff. Heidi Baker thinks it's great. Chris Valaton thinks it's great. Sean Bowles thinks it's great. You know, but here's the deal. Teresa Dedman is on staff at Bethel Church, Redding, California, and has been since 2003. And as BDK has already said, she oversees the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry second year program and then she's the head of the prophetic arts department she travels the u.s and abroad teaching on the supernatural and creativity i mean she's just she's doing the most and this book came out april 17th you ready for this 2012 wow so 2012 is when the destiny card started playing out at bethel wow just saying it's possible the Christ alignment was inspired by Deadman. I don't know. I don't want to go on record saying that for a fact because I can't prove it right now. 
But the fact that she promoted Destiny cards back in 2012 from Bethel, from her platform at Bethel. Remember, she was already on staff in 2003. So she had been a longtime staff member already when she starts playing with Destiny cards. And, and, and she actually claims on her website that she came up with the term Destiny card. Here's what she says. She says, I do not condone the use of tarot cards nor any form of witchcraft in my ministry. And neither does Bethel Church. The destiny cards I refer to in my book, Born to Create, are cards that are one of a kind that people create to bless others or the use of people's photography to bless others. So she's she's giving her little example, but then she goes on and has a second statement, a third statement, a fourth statement, and a fifth, and then finally, her and her team have seen thousands of people come to Christ as they have passed out their destiny cards to people in all sorts of environments and events. That's what she says. And there's a whole lot more here that I'm not even going to read. I'm just making a point. There is a lot of information that she is using and on her website. And this goes all the way back to 2012 at Bethel Church. So this whole crap about them having nothing to do with destiny cards and this is just something new that's kind of coming to the surface. No. Bethel's been promoting this since 2012, maybe even before then. That's just when their first book was published. And if you want to make it even sound more crazy, like either Bill Johnson's straight up being deceptive about it, or there's something even worse that should scare you more as someone that would be going to his church, because either he is being outright deceptive about it, or he doesn't know what's going on in his own church. He has no clue what kind of occult shenanigans are being propagated in his church then. He had no idea that destiny cards were being used, and he had no idea that this stuff was going on, and he's writing forwards to books that outline the practice of destiny cards, and he doesn't know? Then that is not the dude you want to place yourself under for spiritual authority, because he is not protecting the sheep then. He is letting all the wolves go through the gate. So that's even worse, dude. Like if he's just not paying attention and all this stuff is going on and he legitimately didn't know anything about it, then he doesn't know what's going on in his own church in his own supernatural school of ministry. And that's even more egregious to me as a former pastor. All right. I, I don't I don't mean to jump back on this, but I found it. I found it on, on TeresaDebman.com. She has a blog entitled Sharing God's Love Through Destiny Cards. She says here, and this was December 29th, 2017, she says, many of you may not be familiar with why I originally came up with the name Destiny Cards. So this all goes back. She did, in fact, create Destiny Cards. She invented Destiny Cards. So this, I again, right there at Bethel, she invented uh, Destiny Cards. She even says on her blog, she came up with the name Destiny Cards. So the fact that Christ alignment is running around with using destiny cards. This goes right back to the pastor on staff at Bethel. Once again, Bethel is the culprit. So if they're using destiny cards, they stole the idea from Teresa Deadman because she claims that she invented destiny cards. I coined the phrase destiny card to reflect that we call out the gold in others and prophesy life and encouragement to them as 1 Corinthians 14, 3 instructs. And then she goes to quote probably the Passion Translation, who knows. I've also called them encouraging cards, imparting cards. <laughs> Teresa Dedman is now calling them imparting cards because they can impart things. But as with destiny cards, they are one-of-a-kind cards that are meant to bless someone that we know or will meet. Okay, I'm done. I, I can't. I can't do this anymore. I'm done with this. She goes on to explain all of this stuff about Destiny cards, and this is all on Deadman's website. But BDK, I'm, I'm just, I don't want to rant anymore. It's late. I just want to go ahead and pass it on to you. I know you, you have some things you want to say in closing. Sorry that I went so long. No, it's all good because, like, you're right, man. This is 100% gorilla tonight. I had stuff I wanted to say, and I, I, I'm not going to say it because when you were talking something you said really struck me very profoundly. And as you were talking, it just kind of grew in my spirit, man. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to go completely off script and just end us with just a very simple word of clarification, warning, and a word of prayer. 
I had no idea, Justin, that they had a page on their website that showed all the cross-dressing and the homosexuality and the queer lifestyles and all this other stuff. And you said it's Sodom and Gomorrah. You want to know what makes this more egregious than that, Justin? And dude, think about this. Everyone that's listening right now, think about this. Sodom had no Bible. And look what God did to them. Now, we can walk into a dollar store and buy a Bible. And supposedly, Bethel has lots of Bibles. They have schools of supernatural ministries. And Sodom had no Bible. And yet, God shook that place to ashes. I'm going to tell you something, man. The atheists and the Muslims that don't have the greater light that we have are going to be less accountable than us who have two or more churches on every single street corner. And like tonight, how we started this off, dude, a lot of them are becoming corrupt and corrupt because they're patterning themselves either after Joel Olstein, who has the largest church in America and his take the, the, the scripture and use it as a, as a sentence to speak into existence. The things that you want is no different than any of that candle magic uh, spells from the Bible garbage. And the NAR is the largest, fastest growing religious movement. And I want to, I want to be very careful how I say this. And I don't want you to miss it. What's worse than all of this is that we in America have used our money, our tithes, our offerings, our influence, our airwaves, our technology to pump this false gospel of prosperity and Christian mysticism into all of the world. We are spiritually poisoning poor countries who have a small remnant of hope. And all of this stuff is flooding in like a tidal wave. And false revivals are happening. We are poisoning people with this garbage. Do you think that God is blind and that he doesn't see this? And that blood won't be required from our hands? Because our hands are stained, guys. And I don't know about you, but I'm scared in this moment. Because things are about to get real in this country. For the last two years since 2016, like I said in my podcast, God has been drawing me into some very deep times. Where I've been seeing what's going on in this church, man. And I'm telling you, it's about to get real in this hour. It may be a year from now. It may be a month from now. But we need to make sure that our faith is real in this moment. That our devotion to Christ is real as it should be. That he is our King of Kings and he is our Lord of Lords. And that our discernment is strong. And the gift of discerning spirits is at full operation in us. There needs to be oil in the lamp and the Holy Ghost needs to lead us. We need to hear the voice of our good shepherd and another voice we will not follow. Because I'm telling you something, man, judgment begins at the house of the Lord and apostasy and pruning and persecution is a shaking that happens. And if you read the book of Habakkuk, it says that if the righteous will scarcely be saved, what hope do the other people have? That's what's coming to this church because blood is on our hands. We are playing games with the Holy ghost. I want to tell you something, man, this is going to sound so strange. There's a lot of hope in that, Justin. How can there be hope in that? If you understand how God does things, God judges a church. He judges a nation. Anytime he judges his people, he does it with the hope that the remnant in the nation will rise up, will be pure, 
and proclaim the church be truth because of the one thing that God hates. And you look at this throughout all of the scripture, you read the book of revelation and the one thing that he hates is a mixture where we have not discerned good from evil, where we call the sacred, the profane. And we have no distinction between the two where we learn the ways of the heathen, where we no longer call Jesus' name out publicly, where the gospel is about all kinds of supernatural shenanigans instead of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The reason God shakes the house, the reason God allows persecution and disaster to come is so that people will be forced to choose sides, to declare allegiance, and to either be pushed towards brothers of similar and like faith, and more ultimately pushed towards Jesus Christ and devotion to him, or they will fall away in this deception. People ask me all the time, Justin, what can we do to stop this NAR movement? We can't stop it. This is part of the Matthew 24 judgment. These are things that have been prophesied. We are coming upon the end of the age. What we do is what scripture tells us to do. We mark these people out publicly. We warn, we expose the works of darkness, but most importantly, we become the truth that we seek after. Meaning this, the truth sets us free. We become living witnesses to Christ. Man, how many people say, I want to be a living witness to Christ? The Bible's all about it. They're living witnesses, right? John's like, I'm your witness. Um, Antipas was the faithful witness. Stephen was called a witness. You know what that means? Look up that word witness, and it means martyr. Jesus, could Jesus have been saying something completely different than we think? You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be martyrs unto me to all the ends of the earth. When was the last time you ever heard your preacher preach that? Jesus was saying, and and most of the apostles did, didn't they? Gave their lives because they refused to not speak in the name of Jesus. They wouldn't go undercover. So that's what the Holy Spirit is, dude. That's why we've been given the Holy Ghost baptism, Justin. We haven't been given it to yabba dabba do. We haven't been given it to shake. We haven't been given it so that we can get gold fillings in our teeth or see gold flakes passed down. We haven't been given the baptism of the Holy Ghost so that we can prophesy a crazy thing or to use destiny cards. You know what we've been given the Holy Ghost? Because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And when you're faced with martyrdom, when you're faced with the persecution, the apostasy, the pruning, and the shaking that is coming, how do you stand? Unless you're filled with the Holy Ghost to be a martyr. I'm going to leave it there. There's so much I could say on this that I don't have time to say. We often get caught up in the idea of the free gift, the free gift, right? It's free. Salvation's free. But as I've said before, and and many others as well, um, Jesus paid for it. Like he, he paid for it. It wasn't free. It's not cheap. It was very expensive and, and, and it cost him his life. He paid for it. It was the blood of the lamb. It was that valuable. It was timeless. It was eternal. It's the completed covenant. That's why we don't sacrifice animals anymore. And as as BDK talked about the martyr, they didn't care if they lost their life. They didn't care. You can take this life. Take this life. Because this is temporary. What I have is eternal. You you can hurt this body. You can put a bullet in my head. You You can put your nine to my dome doesn't matter. It's temporary. I belong to Jesus. And that's the mentality that these people had, the, these prophets of God had. They knew that they belonged to God. The apostles knew that they belonged to Christ. They knew that there was going to be nothing at all 
that the enemy could take away from them other than this life. And what did Paul say about losing this life? He said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. So as long as I'm alive on this earth, I'm going to proclaim Christ. I'm going to do what Christ has made me for. I'm going to literally proclaim the word of God, even the parts that people don't like. And when I come across something in the word that goes against my life, I'm reading something in the Bible and I say, oh man, that goes directly against something that I'm doing or that I'm thinking or something that I'm behaving. Well, it's not the Bible that's wrong. It's you that's wrong. And it's as Christians, it's our job to have our our loyalties to Christ greater than any other loyalty in this life. And so we say, by the power and the grace of God, we pray that God would give us the strength to walk away from our sin and to align ourselves with the word of God, to align ourselves with Christ. And so that's what we have to do as Christians, even when it's not popular, even when it costs us something great, even when it costs us our job, it costs us our YouTube channel, it costs us Facebook, it costs us friendships, it costs us family members who never want to talk to us again. Because I'm telling you right now, you are not at risk to lose your life like the martyrs of the days old were. The martyrs of the past, their lives were on the line. The apostles, their lives were on the line. Right now, we're not there yet. But most of you are more concerned, and I'm not not talking down to, to our regular listeners when I say this. I'm just saying most Christians, let me rephrase that. Most Christians nowadays, these modern Christians, they're more concerned with appearances. They're more concerned with everybody going home happy. They're more concerned with people feeling good and leaving the party without any confrontation. That's what modern mainstream Christianity has become. It has transformed into something that is so far from the early church and the book of Acts that it's not even recognizable anymore. When you read that, when you read about the early church and you read the early church fathers, the writings that they put out and you compare that to what the church looks like today, it's a polar opposite. They actually had to worry about losing their life. And here we are and we can preach the gospel freely. Like we can actually go out into the street and we can preach the gospel without any problems. I mean, granted, you might get told this is not a free speech zone. You got to go over here, but that's nothing. We have the freedom to preach the gospel unrepentantly. And yet we're running around trying to go undercover. We're going to have an undercover ministry. That's about as retarded as saying I'm going to be a missionary dater. I'm going to go start dating this atheist as a missionary date. You know, because she's really hot. You know, I remember that that was a mindset back in high school in the youth group. Oh, I'm going to be a missionary dater. You know, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to go undercover. You know, you don't go undercover with the gospel unless you're going to a, a third world country that does not allow the preaching. And I'm sorry, but last time I checked, Australia was not like that, and America is not like that. You can still preach the gospel without repentance publicly. Yes, it may cost you a fine here or there, but you are not going to lose your life over it, okay? You do not have to go undercover. You do not have to stop using the name of Jesus. You do not have to deny the true definition of who God is according to the word of God. I don't need to play games with the spirit of creation. I don't need to play games with destiny cards. What I need to do is show people that Jesus Christ left his home, stepped into flesh, walked this earth and showed us how to live. He lived perfectly. He fulfilled the law. He didn't break one small piece of the law because he had to be perfect and blameless. He had to be, he had to have zero fault found in him so that he could be our ultimate sacrifice on Calvary. That's why he fulfilled it. He literally fulfilled the law, meaning he kept every bit of it. He literally, it's like, it's like he made a hundred out of a hundred shots. There was zero error in what he did on this earth. And he set the standard high. And he fulfilled it. And we are to go and share the gospel with the world. That Christ, God in the flesh, came because he loved us. And he paid for every foul and disgusting sin we've ever done. And I want to make a point here. The only thing that makes me any better than the drag queens and the tribal shamans and the occultists. The only thing that allows me to even 
enter into righteousness in God's eyes is the fact that I've been paid for by Christ. Aside from Christ, I'm just as vile as those homosexuals. I'm just as vile as those tribal shamans and mystics. I'm just as vile as the Kabbalists. I'm just as vile as those disgusting Hebrew rooters that deny Jesus. Outside of Christ, I'm exactly like those people. The only good thing in me is Jesus Christ. Him crucified, resurrected, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And all we have to do is believe that and live that and share that. We don't need to candy coat it and play these stupid games. We don't need to mix mysticism and esotericism. We don't need to get in there and try to be so cool with the world. I just want to encourage everybody with this. We're not here to attack people's personal lives. Okay, we're not here to talk about what Bill Johnson does behind closed doors. We're not here to talk about what Chris Valaton did last night at the bar. I, I, I'm using that as an example. I, I'm, I'm just clearly using that. I'm making, I'm, I'm literally, it's just fictional for the sake of an argument. This isn't about the personal lives. I'm not here to chip away at what this person did or that person did. We're here to hold accountability to some of the most famous, quote unquote, Christian pastors in America that are publicly giving statements supporting witchcraft and and esoteric practices, whether they want to admit it or not, we are here to show the error and the theology and the doctrine and the practices so that you or your church or your pastor or your family member does not fall down this rabbit hole of sickness. Because when you go down a path of sin over and over and over and over It doesn't matter if it's homosexuality or if it's magic or if it's any type of mysticism. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be given over to a reprobate mind. And that's where you get to a point where you're not convicted anymore. But you actually think what you're doing is good. You are fully convinced in your own mind that this is good, that it's wholesome, and that it's okay. And I really think that's what's going on in a lot of these ministries. They have been given over to their vain imaginations. And we as the church need to stand up and pray. I know we don't want to pray for these people because they make us sick. We get stressed looking at their websites and reading their posts. But here's the bottom line. They are influential. They are reaching hundreds of thousands of people. We need to pray that the Lord would straighten these things out. But on the other hand, as BDK said, I mean, we're not going to see some crazy end times revival. I think the revival that everybody's expecting is actually going to be the apostasy. It's going to look like a revival, but it's actually going to be an apostasy. The falling away that we read about in 2 Thessalonians. We've got to wake up and we've got to share the truth in love. And we've got to call people to the standard of living that the word of God gives. If they take it, praise God. If they don't, Well, you know what? Their blood's not on my head anymore because I've proclaimed the truth. Please don't hate the messenger in this message tonight. We are literally here to call this. This is almost like a meeting that we're calling with you all to bring about the information on the table that we've been studying. And look, we didn't jump on this thing immediately like so many people did. We had our feelings and our suspicions. We didn't jump on it immediately because we wanted to take time to pray about it and to wait and see how this was going to play out before we join the conversation. So here we are tonight, and it is my prayer that you're able to digest some of these things, that you're able to have been encouraged in what we said, and that you will go to the Lord in prayer over these issues. Because these things are literally metastasizing like a cancer in the church. And the new apostolic reformation is metastasizing like a cancer in the church. And people that I love and care about are being affected by these very things. So I do take it personally. BDK, would you, uh, would you say a word of prayer for us as we close out tonight? Sure. Father, we come in the mighty name of Jesus, and we're not ashamed of that name. Father, give us the conviction of boldness in our hearts to proclaim the name of Jesus, because whom the Son sets free is free indeed. There's only one way to freedom. There's only one way to peace, and that's through the mighty name of Jesus and his holy, precious blood. 
Father, I pray for the church who's more concerned with saving face and going undercover than confessing Jesus. But Lord, you said if we confess Jesus before men, then Jesus will confess us before the Father. And we know that Jesus is interceding for us and he's confessing us before the Father. But are we confessing Jesus before men? Father, would you wake the church up to the power that's in that mighty name? May it be more than just a song we sing about how the name of Jesus breaks every chain. And then we go out on the streets and we're afraid to, 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 to speak. And yet we wonder why there's so many chains not being broken. We may we move past just words in a song into truth that we possess and power that we display in the name of Christ. But more importantly, Father, forgive me. Bend me, break me. Because there are times when, when I don't say what I should say, where I don't speak up because I'm afraid of offending someone, or I've had a long day, or I see somebody and I chicken out at the last minute, even though I know I should proclaim Christ to them. Father, we've all been in that spot where we have gone undercover. Father, take that from us. We lay that down on the altar tonight. And we ask that you embolden us to be witnesses because it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by thy spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Lord, would you empower us to live such an authentic witness life that if it were to cost us everything, we would be faithful. Father, there might come a time where we, where we come to a moment where it might be illegal to say the name of Jesus. In that moment, may we have already been found faithful, that we have never gone underground in our faith, that we boldly proclaim Christ whether man allows us to or not. Father, work in my heart now so that I'm prepared for that hour. Work in all of our hearts now that we are prepared for that hour. May we be like Paul. May we say that all the suffering in the world is nothing compared to the hope of glory that's within us. Because within us is Christ, the hope of glory. Father, would you return your glory to the temple? A temple made without stone, without hands. Would you return your glory to us? Would you visit us with your glory? Would you find a resting place in us? Would we be the temples of the Holy Spirit once again? Would you revive your remnant in this hour? Would we separate ourselves from the profane and return to the sacred? Would we pursue holiness if we say that we're filled with the holiness of the ghost of God? Be with us, Jesus. Give us a desire for you and a hunger for holiness and and a complete lack of appetite for the things of this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it has been great to be back with you guys. And uh, BDK, thank you so much for joining me tonight on The Fourth Watch. And uh, man, I hope this has blessed you guys. I, I hope that at the very least you've, you've been challenged or you've had things confirmed in your spirit. But again, we have to stay in the Word of God. We have to stay prayed up and stay in regular communion with our Creator. It's God's will that we know Him personally and that we walk with Him in the light of His love, His grace, His mercy, His provision. If you've never entered into that relationship, stay tuned and I'm going to share with you shortly how this can be your day of salvation. Until the next time we meet again, God bless and good night. If you're listening right now and you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ Yeshua as your personal Lord and Savior, and you haven't accepted his holy sacrifice on the cross to pay for your sins, it is absolutely impossible for you to have a solid understanding of his word. It's also impossible to find protection from the demonic realm and the days that are fast approaching, friends. And furthermore, it is impossible for you to have peace with Yahweh, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the good news. You can start anew right now. You can repent of your sins and you can have the wages of your sins paid in full. 
Now is the time to repent and turn away from your sins and make right with the will of God. The Bible actually declares that we don't know what tomorrow holds, so we must take action with the time that we have right now. Repentance is the first step, regardless of what you may have heard. This means turning 180 degrees from your past thoughts, actions, and lifestyles that are in opposition to the Most High God. Understand that repentance is a process, and it is absolutely attainable because of the grace and mercy and power of God. Because of Jesus Christ and His once and for all sacrifice, you can be forgiven of all of your iniquity and every sin you've ever committed. Yahweh is a jealous God, but He is also rich in mercy. And tonight, if you're willing to admit your wrongs and repent, He is willing to meet you right where you are, and He will show you that mercy right now, friends. The wages of our sin is death, but tonight we can receive the gift of God, which is eternal life, but only through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. I am so thankful that God sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross, a living sacrifice, who shed His sinless and perfect blood to pay the debt of our sins, which offers us the ability to be seen as blameless before God on that day of judgment. And make no mistake, there will come a day of judgment, ladies and gentlemen. Let today be the beginning of your communion and peace with God as you are filled with the Holy Spirit and you can begin putting on the armor of God and growing in an intimate relationship with Him. It is the will of God that you don't perish, but rather that you repent and enter into a relationship with Him based on His terms. If you're not sure of what God's terms are, I want to challenge you to start reading your Bibles and learn firsthand what God expects from you. If you don't have a Bible, we highly recommend that you pick up a King James Bible, which is easy for anyone to find. Jesus Christ is our only hope, friends, and my prayer is that you believe on Him tonight. That's the most important part of the show, and by far the most important decision you will ever have to make in this life. Amen. It's been an interesting adventure tonight, and I sure hope you've all enjoyed this broadcast. If you ever miss a show or would like to go back and re-listen to an old one, every show is archived on our website, fourthwatchradio.com, all spelled out, F-O-U-R-T-H-W-A-T-C-H-R-A-D-I-O.com, fourthwatchradio.com. There you'll find links to multiple streaming options, and every broadcast is dated and summarized for your convenience. Everything we offer is completely free, including our mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. You can easily click the link on the website to be taken to whichever app store applies to your device. Be sure to stay tuned in every Thursday for all the latest shows. Like us on Facebook and feel free to add my personal page as well. If the Fourth Watch is ministered to you and you would like to help support this ministry, you can follow the donate link on our website. I bid you all a week filled with grace and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll see you all next week. God bless and good night. You're listening to The Fourth Watch with Justin Fall on The Fourth Watch Radio Network.